Uh, so good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeal, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. John O'Rourke. John, I believe, is on the is on by phone. And um, uh, uh, Stephen Redlack here. Aaron Ford. Before we op formally open the hearing, I will confirm that Sean and Aaron are present. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valerelli. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening. And uh, Kelly Lineman is here from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I don't believe Vincent Lee is with us tonight. Is that uh, correct? I, I'm right here. Oh, you're there. Oh, good. Good to have you as well. Um, consultants for the board, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Haverty. And uh, I have a beta group, uh, Marty Nover. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Also with me tonight is Tyler DeRuder and Dennis Flynn, both professional traffic operations engineer and Bill McGrath, professional engineer civil. Perfect. Thank you all. And on behalf of the applicant, uh, Stephanie Kiefer. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Ms. Kiefer, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. And the applicant has with them this evening, I believe our, our full suite. So we have Glenn Noise and Art Clipsell of Oak Tree. Uh, John Hessian, our engineer. Uh, Derek Roach, our traffic engineer. Scott Blasslock um, from Bruce Hamilton, architectural team and housing consultant Bob Engler, I believe is here. And I, I think that's everyone we have on the team this evening. Perfect, thank you. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda and as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting, but we only have one item on this evening's meeting. Um, before we start in on that, um, I saw that Aaron Ford is with us. Aaron, good to see you. Steve, sure, I'm late. Not a problem. And uh, is Mr. O'Rourke on? He is, Mr. Chairman. He's, he is. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. So on our posted agenda, this brings us to item number two, the continuation of Thorndike Place. Um, 
Turning to comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place at the prior hearing on June 29th, 2021, the discussion focused on aspects of the proposed senior independent living building for Thorndike Place. There were several questions and concerns raised during the hearing and several parties, including the applicant, town departments and peer review engineers requested additional time to properly respond to those questions and concerns. At the July 13th, 2021 hearing, the board voted to extend the public hearing period and continue the hearing to this evening. The board has received revised documents from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, town departments, and town committees and commissions. Those have been posted to the website and to the agenda. There were some that came in uh, very late this afternoon. Um, those have been added to uh, the bottom of the agenda. Uh, the plan for tonight's hearing is to have a presentation from the applicant outlining the changes from the prior proposal. The board's peer review consultants and town departments will then be invited to comment the board will proceed with its questions and then we will then open the hearing for public comment. So with that, I will uh, turn to Ms. Kiefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, good evening members of the board. Um, I'm sure you are very familiar with our, our team this evening and I think you'll be hearing from each of them um, in some fashion. Uh, so as the chairman had indicated when we, uh, at the last hearing there had been um, a submission, submissions that had come in on about August 2nd or 3rd, um, and, and those were into the record. Um, but since that time, there was an opportunity for um, Beta Peer to review those and provide their comments, which they did on, on or about August 17th. Uh, and then for town comments came in um, through a consolidated town memo letter dated August 23rd, and then the Arlington Conservation Commission likewise submitted their seventh comment letter on August 23rd. Um, and since that time, um, we collected that and um, we submitted on the 31st of August, BSC submitted its uh, complete set of site plans. So previously we had done updates and, and perhaps four sheets of the full set had been updated, but on August 31st, um, Beta incorporated uh, the, the, the prior um, tweaks and modifications we had discussed, as well as responding to comments that had been raised that were very helpful in both the Beta civil peer review and as well as the town, um, the town staff kind of collective comment level of August 23rd. So that came in on August 20, August 31st, pardon me, uh, together with the updated stormwater together with the um, four sheets of uh, truck trimming profiles and trying to think what else we had come in. Um, updated stormwater, the updated civil design sheets and the turning profiles. Uh, and when we get to John, he'll correct me if I'm missing one. Um, then three days later on September 2nd, the applicant submitted, um, that was our filing deadline, um, we submitted um, a response letter to the town's comment letter. We submitted the applicant's response letter to the Arlington Conservation Commission's letter. Uh, we submitted the applicant's response to Beta's waiver review. Uh, we submitted VAI's response to Beta's traffic review, and I, I should comment the two documents that I missed that BSC had submitted on the 31st had been BSC's response to Beta's civil and wetlands review and Beta's response to the town's comments that pertain to civil and wetland matters. Um, and then we submitted the, uh, the updated waiver list um, with, there was really no update to that other than correcting that the uh, requested waiver for parking was 95 spaces, I believe it previously said 96. Um, so with that full suite of documents that have been provided, um, I, I think the one thing, and, and, and it may come out uh, once you hear from John and from Derek and from Scott, um, the project really hasn't changed. But what we've done is we've provided, and I think Mr. Hanlon, you had requested this, you had said at one point that you just wanted to see what, what everything was for the current proposal and to kind of have it in one big chunk. And so here we have with us this evening, the full set of civil, the full set of architectural, all of the responses to the professionals, whether it's beta peer review, 
or the town staff professionals that have commented, um, updated stormwater, updated traffic. So that whole suite of materials is, is there and we think that we responded to everything. If there are any lingering questions or comments, we're happy and, and very happy to, to address those tonight. Um, but before we, uh, I turn it over, I, I will first turn it over to uh, just a review of the civil to John. Um, just a reminder as we've all been here for so long, <clears throat> kind of how this project has evolved. And back in 2016, we were looking at a 219 unit multifamily project with 12 duplex units. And, um, and, and, and that was before the board when it came back in November of 2020. And we kind of proceeded along that until the fall of 2020. And we went to 176 unit multifamily project. And, and that had been revised and, and tweaked and, and we had changed kind of how the building like graduated, um, but it was, went, it was 176 units. And then um, in response to the board's request in just this past May, um, we looked at the reintroduction of the townhouses and we you know, further reduced kind of the building. And that's when where we are where we are today. So we have the 12 townhouse units, the behind that the senior living um, 124 unit and, and the project has a very defined um, kind of development footprint, if you will. And um, one of the other additional submissions I should have mentioned um, with the engineering packet is um, we, we provided the board kind of that line of where we're proposing the conservation parcel. And so it would be 12 acres. And um, we're, pretty, we're pretty satisfied with that. It, it keeps the development within a small footprint and it leaves like a, a little uh, restoration woodland area right behind it. Um, and then it has 12 acres of conservation land. Um, and so without further ado, I think I will turn, turn it over now to John Hessian. He can walk you through um, the updates to the civil. Well, I don't think we've really changed the project, but we've updated. Um, and from there, um, I would ask that Derek Roach uh, likewise give the update on traffic, and then we'll turn it over to Scott um, to walk through the architectural updates. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, good evening. <clears throat> um, I am going to share my screen if that's okay. And I have permission, it looks like I have permission to do that. Please proceed. Um, so I, I will start off by um, saying that Stephanie pretty much uh, covered most of what I was gonna cover. So I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but um, you know, from a, a big picture perspective, Stephanie is, is accurate from the, as it relates to the site plan, not much has changed over the past couple of months. Um, what we did was exactly what Stephanie said, and, and I had it in my notes, and I, I think it was Mr. Hanlon that the, the phrase I put in my notes was a you know restated application. So what we've done is we've submitted full site plans, stormwater report, and other supporting exhibits, the vehicle turning exhibits, uh, the one thing that Stephanie you you left off your lift list was you caught it at the end there was the uh, proposed conservation parcel exhibit and um, um, now I've forgotten one of the exhibits uh, but that'll come back to me so what we submitted was a final compilation of responses to Beta's August 18th peer review letter. And as Stephanie said, the town department comments that were dated August 23rd. I will um, say that in our response back in early August, we said that we would have revised materials back in on, I believe it was the 24th or 25th of, it was the 24th of August, but where we received the pretty comprehensive town comments on the 23rd, the day before, we felt it was prudent to submit, you know, one final 
revised, responsive, uh, you know, to use Mr. Hanlon's words, restated application. So that's why those revised materials weren't submitted until the 31st. It gave us the opportunity to, to sift through the town department comments and, and try to be fully responsive to those. Um, what I, so, and when I said there, there were really no substantive plan changes to the site plans. Most of the responses were what I would call dotting the I's and crossing the T's, you know, um, utility connections in the street, what public works wanted or engineering wanted from the town. We addressed those cleanup items in the revised drawings. But um, a few things I, I do want to highlight, and I have, you know, a colored um, version of the, the landscape planting plan up on the screen here. But a, a couple of things, there, there were comments from, I believe from Beta and from the town regarding the number of uh, bicycle parking spaces. I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we've always had a um, bicycle storage area on this Northern wall of the senior living building. That's approximately 60 feet long, or it is 60 feet long, and will house um, 28 bicycles. Um, our previous version of the site plan, we showed one exterior bike rack um, for visitors at the main entrance to the senior living. In response to some of those comments, we've added a second bike rack for a, a total of 12 um, bicycle uh, spaces by the main entry to the senior living building. Um, and what we're looking at here, we, in the past, we had provided updated, you know, layout of materials, grading and drainage and, and utility drawings. But um, as part of this revised package that was submitted on the 31st, we've updated the landscaping plan that had last been updated in November based on a previous iteration of the project. But this plan has been updated uh, based on the, the 12 duplex uh, ownership units and the 124 unit senior living uh, development proposal. Um, what one thing that uh, Stephanie uh, mentioned, one thing that I wanted to point out um, is in the area between really what I'll call like the development footprint. So well, the limit of the emergency vehicle access drive out to our proposed parcel boundary, but not including the 25 foot, um, no disturb to the, to the bordering vegetated and, and uh, isolated vegetated wetlands, a, a woodland restoration plan that will include the removal of invasive species. So obviously, let me step back, within the development footprint, um, we're gonna be removing invasive species and downed, um, downed trees and, and things of that nature to clean up the site to prepare it for the proposed development. But outside of that footprint and within you know, the limits of the proposed development parcel, um, you know, the applicant is proposing to do this woodland restoration removal of invasives, removal of that down timber that's not providing any habitat value or is a, 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 a you know, a, a, a hazard in some way, and then revegetating with the appropriate native um, species that will provide, you know, better wildlife and, and habitat and a better, um, I'm not a woodland restoration expert, but will provide a better diversity of, um, of vegetation in that area. And from the, the site visit that we had done uh, back early in the summer with Emily Sullivan, a lot of this area has been trampled and is actually void of vegetation um, in the area where there was uh, previously part of the homeless encampment. So um, that's some, uh, I think a key thing that's been added um, that I wanted to point out the um, vehicle turning movements have been provided showing you know, the Arlington ladder truck being able to circulate the entire um, perimeter of the project 
and also to be able to turn up the main, what I'll call the cul-de-sac to the main entrance of the senior living building, um, but kind of do a three-point turn and back out and exit back out to Dorothy Road and Little John. We've also shown, uh, provided turning exhibits for an ambulance. Uh, there was previously some discussion about the, the amount of ambulances that may be needed here and, and to demonstrate that those can make that movement easily. Also, we've included a senior shuttle, um, a, a senior shuttle bus or a jitney that's been proposed to be uh, part of the uh, kind of TDM program for the project. And lastly, we've uh, included a template for a trash truck to demonstrate that, you know, trash and deliveries will be able to get to the, to the loading dock area. Um, and, you know, I guess in a, a quick summary, that's, that's the extent of the, you know, site plan revisions. They're, they're really minimal. You can't see them. Um, I, I will, since we have this pointed out, this area, I don't know that we've talked about it um, that much in previous meetings, but in previous iterations of the plan, there was surface a surface parking lot on the western portion of the site. And this is now an exterior like amenity lawn, um, you know, community garden area for the residents of the senior living. Um, you know, it'll it'll have places to sit and read and and also some potential activities um, and and probably some you know people that want to you know get their fingernails dirty and and do a little uh, vegetable or flower gardening. Um, and then, you know, kind of in summary, um, you know, we receive an updated or a new peer review letter from Beta um, dated yesterday, September 8th, as a review of the, all the revised site plan materials that we submitted on the 31st. And um, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but my reading of it is that all outstanding comments have been addressed. And with the exception of three um, three items that they beta has actually pointed out could be handled as conditions if the if the board so chose and we would agree with that one was the um, additional test pits to determine seasonal high groundwater and we've discussed that in, in the past and the applicant has committed to do that as a condition of approval in the past. Um, also, uh, they've mentioned a construction management plan. And again, we've, can, we've discussed that in the past and agreed that that would be provided in coordination with town departments and police and fire um, prior to uh, any building permit being issued for the project. And then lastly, they had a comment with respect to um, a, including a note regarding um, um, snow storage in the long-term operations and, and management plan for the project. And that could easily be accomplished prior to building permit also. So I do have, you know, all the turning templates and full set of plans and, and the um, conservation uh, parcel exhibit if there's any questions, but um, I wanted to keep it, it brief and, and to the point. So. I'll hand it over to, I guess, um, Derek to talk a little bit about traffic. All right, All right. thanks, John. Um, hi, so I'm Derek Roach, uh, professional engineer, um, senior transportation engineer with Vanass and Associates. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the updates that we've done to traffic since we were here last. Um, we updated the trip generation um, to match the, the current proposal um, of the senior living and the 12 townhouse units. Um, in that trip generation, um, based on comments from both Beta and the town, uh, we addressed the, the mode split concerns um, that the senior living uh, facility wouldn't 
you uh, have the same mode split as the normal residents of the area as the census data shows, but um, they would still have some sort of mode split. So what we did is we took about half of um, the mode, we took exactly half, 23%. And so we applied a non-auto um, reduction to those trips of 23% <clears throat> led to about four to five less trips in the peak hours um, compared to the previous. And that's about a 15% reduction in tri trips. Um, so based on that, we ran the analysis and, and as beta states in their letter, um, that the analysis is, is, um, pretty much the same as previous with, with no, no real changes to, to what was previously presented. Um, and the town's comment letter, um, concurred that the approach of the mode split, uh, was acceptable in, in the right approach. Uh, in their consideration. Um, we did also provide, we provided the a few auto turn analyses of the trucks getting down little John in that analysis, in, in that um, letter that beta reviewed and the town reviewed. Um, and as John was saying uh, yesterday on the eighth, we uh, received, a, well, actually we received it today, but it's dated the eighth. Um, from beta um, with their final review of all the changes and the updated analysis and, and the figures and whatnot. And, and um, as far as, I don't want, again, I don't want to put words in their mouth like John said, but as, as far as we're concerned, uh, it seems all of the outstanding issues have been addressed um, and that they concur with the analysis as presented. Um, and so I don't want to, again, I, like John said, I don't want to belabor points that have, that we've, that we've already talked about here. Um, so I'll keep it short and, and, you know, based on what we've heard from beta and the town, it seems that all, all comments are addressed. And, and if the, that's not the case, we'd be happy to, to, to answer any more questions. Thank you, Derek. Um, I, I think Derek's was probably the, uh, kind of the, the, the most stale, if you will, because uh, they had submitted their updated, um, I think back in August, and, and so it's kind of gone back and forth a little bit. So Beta's uh, most, or uh, pardon me, um, BAI's most recent submittal um, within the recent filing was just uh, uh, the response to the Beta peer review. So there really wasn't any further traffic analysis that was submitted in the September. Um, package. But with that being said, if, if the board has any questions on the traffic, um, we can either have Derek field those now or if you want to wait until we've done had all of our um, areas addressed in our presentation this evening. Why don't you go ahead and, and, uh, and complete the presentation? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and then lastly, then we will have um, Scott, if he could share his screen. Um, and so, uh, as kind of intro to, to Scott. So in our uh, September 2nd submittal, we had provided um, the updated architecturals that was um, that responded to both comments that the um, board had previously previously made, as well as uh, comments made within the the town's uh, the town staff uh, combined public comment or comment letter. And um, one of the comments in there had been asking for um, additional information kind of on, on colors and materials for the design of the buildings and they asked for additional perspectives. And so as we had explained in our written responses on the second, uh, those um, are our vendor that does those. He couldn't do the turnaround fast enough, but we submitted kind of two dimensionals within our response. And then uh, earlier today we received those. And so we submitted those as part of the record and um, Scott will be able to include that within his presentation, but uh, just to let the board know, it's not any new, like it's not any change to the design. It's just that we were waiting basically for the uh, perspectives to come back in because the turnaround on that. So with that said, um, Scott, if you could uh, take the floor, please. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Scott Vlasak from Bruce Hamilton Architects and we are the project architects. Um, so as Stephanie has already said, there's really no changes. So 
uh, like John and Derek, I'll kind of keep my presentation as brief and focused to the uh, newly submitted uh, changes uh, to the materials. So um, starting with the site plan um, here, uh, the three things really that I'll be talking about will be the, um, the changes to the colors and materials, as Stephanie just said, and that happens on both the duplex townhouses along Dorothy Road, as well as to the main independent living building. Um, I'll be talking about a few just minor changes to the garage plan, and again, that's on the independent living building, and I'll be talking about uh, just briefly about uh, how we've indicated um, a suggested distribution of the affordable units um, throughout the independent living building and the um, duplex townhouses. But before I leave this site plan, uh, because we don't have it really indicated any other way, I'll start with just the duplex townhouses. Um, I do want to say the, the duplex townhouses will be completely identical um, for the interiors and the exteriors in terms of architectural design, finishes, uh, exterior materials. But um, for now, you know, what we've designated is that there'd be three of these units that would be affordable. And so we've marked that as number, we've numbered them one through 12, uh, starting at the west end here. So number two uh, is marked with AFU for affordable unit as an abbreviation, uh, number six and number 11. Um, so uh, as Stephanie just said, the new perspectives that we are submitting, I'll show you those next. Um, it's the same perspective, but maybe for those who haven't seen that perspective before, um, where we're going to be standing is right about, um, say, here on Dorothy Road, and we're going to be looking west. And the second perspective that I've prepared um, tonight is looking at the main entrance of the independent living building. So right in this area here. Um, so I just wanted to use the site plan to kind of um, set the table for those things. So the first perspective here, um, I'm sure most of you have seen it before. Uh, this is looking west down Dorothy Road. And uh, again, the main changes here are uh, just illustrating some of the um, siding variations and color variations that we've um, had submitted on the second. Uh, and those were shown on the two dimensional uh, exterior elevations, which I will show you as well quickly uh, before I conclude. Uh, the other changes to this perspective were really the landscape, uh, some of the minor landscape changes that John had mentioned. Um, there's a row of hedges out here at the street. Um, then the new landscape plan has more of just um, lawns that are more in keeping with the neighborhood, uh, low plantings along the buildings here. And then you can see the street trees would give that same rhythm, very similar to what was proposed before. And we've kind of showed those ghosted intentionally here so that, you know, again, you can see the architecture. The second uh, perspective here is the uh, main entrance of the independent living building. And uh, the few things that I'll point out here, um, in addition to just being a general kind of orientation to how this entrance will work, you have the, uh, the turning circle uh, that John and Derek had both talked about with respect to traffic, circulation, drop off at the main entrance. Um, you have the main entrance itself, which has uh, accent siding and a canopy with some modest signage. Uh, and you can see the other areas of the building here where we've introduced some color uh, variation. I think in our last submittal, we had more or less a consistent siding that wrapped around the entire um, building. So we, we had articulated the ground floor and the upper floor, but we hadn't really articulated how the sidings would break up uh, between those two. So we've done that um, in both the two-dimensional elevations and in this um, perspective. A couple other things to point out quickly would be the bike uh, bicycle racks uh, for short-term parking that uh, John had mentioned in his presentation. Um, and um, I, I think that's um, that's really all for this perspective. So again, apologize in the delay in getting those to you, but I hope that these are helpful in in further describing the architecture and kind of the the look and the feel of of what it'll be like to um, to be on the site in this uh, view. So the next plan that I'm coming to here is the garage plan. Um, 
I, I won't really zoom in and show you everything, but a couple of things to, to mention and highlight. Um, it had been suggested previously that based on the population of the independent living building, there should probably be additional accessible parking spaces. So we have added those in this area. Uh, they are close to the core circulation areas like the elevators. Uh, we had also um, been a little bit less specific in our last presentation about where the electric uh, vehicle charging stations would be. So we've actually taken the time now to um, label those individually. So um, we have um, 10 spaces here um, for electric vehicle charging and those would be um, built. Um, these um, 10 spaces here would be what we would call EV ready. So they'd be wired. Um, everything about the design and construction of the building would be anticipating that those could be installed. Um, but maybe the, the charging stations themselves would not be installed and it, it could simply be based on demand. Um, if the demand exists, then those would be set up to be uh, converted to EV ready uh, spaces. As John mentioned, um, just to quickly review, this is the uh, bicycle parking uh, shed here, which has 28 spaces. Um, the two bicycle parking space for short term near the main entrance that I just showed you in the perspective can have 12 bicycles. And then we also thought it might be appropriate to reserve a small area here near the entrance to the garage as a reserved area for additional bicycle parking. If there's became a need, uh, for example, with staff um, that work at the building, um, that is an area that can easily be um, used for that purpose. So to that end, um, you know, John had pretty well summarized this, but we did add a bicycle, bicycle parking summary to the garage plan as well. Um, we also made a few additional notes to the parking summary here to basically uh, explain what, what I had just reviewed with um, accessible parking. Um, I think that's it for, oh, and we all, the last thing on the um, garage plan is there was a request to just clarify the length of the parking spaces. So we have added dimensions. Um, the length of the space is 18 feet as required by the um, zoning regulation. So we did clarify that and add a dimension. The next um, plan that I'll show is the floor plans. And this has to do with the distribution of affordable units. So what we've done to clarify that is to just basically indicate, um, I'll give you an example here. Uh, this unit is in yellow um, and this unit is in yellow. The more intense yellow, we've kind of tried to pop those out to indicate where the affordable units are. Uh, again, the intent is that the, the units are identical uh, in terms of finishes, um, but the distribution we understand has to be, um, you know, fairly equal throughout or distributed throughout. So we've also um, updated the unit matrix to indicate that. Um, the caveat, I guess, to this is that we should mention, uh, of course, the um, subsidizing agency will do their final review of location of all units. And, you know, if there's any minor changes needed, um, you know, that's a possibility, but we more or less wanted to give the board the assurance that these would be distributed um, uh, equally throughout and not concentrated into any one area of the building. Um, so that happens on each floor plan. I'll just flip through them quickly so that I can get to uh, the two dimensional elevations here. These really just illustrate in two dimensional form what you saw on the 3D perspectives. So for the duplex townhouses here, we're showing how the different areas of siding and color would break up uh, the building masses and help to articulate um, the, the two separate residents that happen there. And likewise for the, um, so you get a, another view of that here on the Dorothy Road elevation. And then for the um, independent living building, um, you can see kind of in a more global exterior elevation scale here, how those different areas of siding help to, again, break up the, the um, various facades. And, connect, and particularly connecting with the roof, uh, the peaked elements that we already had 
um, up near the parapet. And just going through those quickly, I think that really is everything that I wanted to mention. Um, the last two set, uh, sheets here really didn't change. They're the site section sheets that uh, more or less describe the geometry of the site. Um, so that really concludes my presentation. And again, I'd be um, happy to answer any questions um, if and when um, the board has them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I, th I think that that probably kind of concludes our formal presentation. I mean, obviously there were a lot more materials and responsive documents and we're happy to uh, get into any questions that you may have and pull up if there's a specific plan that you need. But um, we think, and as I uh, indicated previously, the, uh, the project now, um, you know, as, as we introduced the revised concept in May, we, we do recognize that pieces have been, you know, we've been responding, um, you know, a little bit piecemeal, you know, to whatever the board had asked. Um, and I think that um, kind of with your assistance actually in, in setting those deadlines for full submissions, what we presented this evening um, and, and what we submitted previously and are presenting this evening, um, does a complete package, if you will, um, and we we uh, we look forward to you know providing any concluding comments that you may have. But um, uh, I, I think the the project is is very well defined, well thought out, and um, and thanks um, not just to the the team obviously, but but to the board for its feedback, to Beta for its feedback, and um, the public and and the professional town staff. Um, it's been very helpful to uh, roll up our sleeves and, and to get this out there. So with that said, um, please, should you have any questions, um, we're here to respond. Thank you very much. Um, if there's anyone to the board who wants to ask a question at this point, we can. Otherwise, I was going to go ahead and ask uh, Beta to go ahead and um, discuss what they had provided. Mr. Mills. Yes, Mr. Chairman, if we can go back to that last slide of the site that showed the turnaround and everything. My one question is, and I was a little confused, I was trying to read through it today. How exactly would a fire truck get between the turnaround and the right side of the building there, that frontage? It looks like there's trees in there. You know, they say the, the road, you know, goes all the way around, but in fact, it doesn't. It seems like there's a gap there. Could somebody illuminate uh, what the fire department's response was? Um, I First, I'll ask uh, Mr. Mills, maybe it would be helpful if John pulled up one of his turning exhibits. Would that Whatever. be helpful? Thank you. Yeah, I'll give you the, stop my share. One moment, please. John wasn't expecting me to ask him to pull that point up. No, at this point, I'm ready for that. <clears throat> um, bear with me here while I share screen. All right, can everybody see that exhibit? Yes. Awesome. So um, what we used here was the Arlington ladder truck and the dimensions of it is down here at the bottom of the figure. And we looked at the turning movements for a fire truck entering from Little John and, and Dorothy being able to travel the main driveway. We have a mountable curb right here on the, on the driveway going towards the parking garage under the senior living. And we have a, an appropriate width emergency vehicle access route all the way around the south side of the building. It's able to make this corner. So these lines that are here, that's the that's the limit of the you know the truck um, you know wheel movement. It makes this corner is able to navigate up here and back out to Dorothy Road. It is able to make either a right-hand turn onto Dorothy or, or a left-hand turn 
Um, and then we, we also looked at, um, so we know that the fire truck can make full circulation around the entire site. But then the, a question was asked about, could it come up the main drive aisle? Um, and we looked at a fire truck coming up and it, it, it does not make a turnaround in the, in the cul-de-sac area, but it is able to back out like a three point turn back down the driveway and head out, which um, the feedback that we got from the fire department was that any truck turning would have to be in accordance with you know the state um, fire code and you can do a, um, a hammerhead you know or a three-point turn for something like this if it's 150 feet in length or less and I, I believe that was actually in uh, beta's traffic peer review as one of their comments or something that they acknowledge or maybe it was actually in the civil um, so we've demonstrated that it can make the entire perimeter of the site and access up towards the, the main entrance of the senior living building. Does that clarify? Thank you, sir. Um, I appreciate all that. I'm wondering about the gap between the turnaround circle and to the right of it, the turnaround circle. It looks like it's all landscaped in there and it's not pavement or whatever. So, yes, if you circle to the right of it. Yes, now the front of the building behind the first three duplexes. No, the next three, please. Oh, these three. Yeah, so right behind there, how would a fire truck get in there if it had to get to the front of those buildings with a ladder truck? Um, there's no fire department access, but again, the fire department's comments was that it be designed to provide circulation and access in accordance with the state fire code. And there's this meets this distance where a truck cannot travel um, meets the it does not exceed the distance you know if the truck is here um, it does not have to have uh, truck access across the entire front of the building. So the fire chief is happy with that. The the fire chief to to be perfectly honest has somewhat deferred you know final review comments until building permit application. But one of the, the mitigating factors for not having that um, full access across the front of the building is that this building will be fully sprinklered and alarmed, which changes the fire department under the state fire code, what the requirements are for you know physical access to each side of the building. Okay, thank you, sir. You've answered my question. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, ask Marty Nover if or review the, if there's any outstanding comments um, from Beta Group, who's the the board's peer review consultants. Yes, so so we have um, both Bill McGrath and uh, Tyler DeRuder and Dennis Flynn here. I think we'll start with Sybil um, since we're on the subject somewhat, um, and that that would be Bill. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Marty. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Again, Bill McGrath with Beta Group. Um, I think John Hessian did a good job of, of summarizing you know, where we're at in our review, but I'll just uh, clarify a couple of points. You know, I think the latest submission of the design and the analysis for the stormwater, I think we're satisfied that that demonstrates that, that the project is managing all of their surface runoff on site. Um, one change in, from a, a comment we had in our previous letter that um, the analysis had been showing some increase, um, even though it was relatively small, going towards Dorothy Road. Um, in this latest submission, uh, the site's been regraded to uh, make sure that, that there's no increase in runoff towards Dorothy Road. And again, everything is managed on site. Um, so I think at, at this point, we're satisfied with that. Um, the two outstanding items, um, and Mr. Hessian mentioned it as well, is, is final determination um, of the seasonal hog groundwater table. Um, 
you know the the site development has been been raised up since the some of the previous iterations uh, but I still think there's some question about where that seasonal high groundwater table is. Uh, you know, I think one of the questions is the timing of when that those test pits are done and, and that information is provided, you know, whether, whether it should wait um, until closer to construction or, or whether, you know, that information should be, be gathered uh, now. Um, it may be valuable to the board if, if it does indicate there's any design changes needed. So, um, you know, I, I, I think certainly given the, the rain we've had and, you know, I'll defer somewhat to uh, conservation as well, but, you know, we may be able to get that information sooner rather than later. And I think the other piece is the uh, construction management plan. Um, I think that's gonna be a valuable piece of information uh, going forward, both for the board, the town and the neighborhood. Um, I suggest that maybe, and I know all the information isn't available at this point, but maybe if, if the applicant could provide a draft of, of a construction management plan to the board uh, before you make a decision, at least outlining what the, the CMP will, will contain and maybe talking about some of the information that probably should be available in terms of phasing the project, uh, construction access uh, through the neighborhood, um, how the site might be managed in terms of, of where part, uh, construction workers might park their vehicles. You know, some of that information I, I think is probably available at this point. And some of the other details probably have to wait uh, until further along. So, but like I say, other than those, those two issues and, and just a couple of other minor Clean up things on the on the plans and the long term pollution prevention plan. Uh, I think at this point we don't have any further comments. Okay, thank you. Were there comments on the on the uh, transportation side? Sure. sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tyler Derrida from Beta. Uh, we provided uh, some response to comments uh, yesterday, uh, responding to BAI's responses. Um, as they mentioned earlier in the meeting, uh, we've taken a look at things like trip generation, mode split, and the traffic operations. Um, the outstanding comments that really were looked into were the vehicle circulation patterns, so the, the turning sketches. Um, one of the things that we highlighted were the bus, the, the Jitney bus that was utilized has to cross over to the opposite side of the driveway to circulate around the cul-de-sac. Um, and, you know, in looking at it, um, there was a comment noting that the property manager or the, the property owner would lease or own uh, that, that vehicle. Um, so we believe that they would be able to manage how that, uh, that vehicle operates um, and ensure that um, there's nothing blocking them from making that maneuver throughout the course of the day if they have to. Um, one thing I would note um, in just looking at the slides today is there is one sketch that shows the center island of the cul-de-sac as green. Um, which suggests that that might be grass and or raised. And then there was another rendering we saw that showed the island as uh, gray. Um, so one of the questions now would be, you know, is that going to be a flush island or a raised island? Um, if it's flush and or mountable, should a vehicle otherwise be in the cul-de-sac, um, the bus or an emergency vehicle, you would expect to be able to drive over that island and potentially get around them. Um, if it's raised, that may or may not be the same situation. So I would request that they kind of clarify uh, what that island is going to look like. Um, in terms of the fire truck, that was sort of discussed um, in the front of the building. And then it's in the, in the rear, uh, there was a comment in one of the documents that stated that the backside path around the rear of the building would be a six foot wide pavement path with uh, 14 feet of, of uh, reinforced uh, soil. 
or, or grass. Um, so we would defer to the fire chief to make sure that they can get their truck over that type of a surface. Um, those were really the, the outstanding couple of bits there. Um, be happy to answer anything else. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time from the board? Or um, I do want to um, ask the Conservation Commission to, to join us for a minute. So Ms. Chapnick, if you're available. Can you hear me? I can. This is Susan. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Klein. Um, I do have a few um, comments or questions um, based on on the new material, and some of it just may be my confusion. I'll start with the waivers. Um, it looks like the updated waiver list is pretty similar to the previous waiver list. Um, though the comment letter um, on data's waiver list um, showed that the applicant agreed with, with many of beta and the uh, Conservation Commission's determinations that some of these waivers were not required or not necessary, and we recommended they be rescinded um, to be requested, not to be requested, because um, they were met by the change in the plan. Um, so I guess I don't understand why the same waiver list is, is being um, proposed. Maybe somebody could explain that to me. Ms. Kiefer, if you don't mind. Sure, no problem, thank you. Um, uh, so the, the waiver list, um, Beta had responded to certain um, of the waiver requests and, and then the, uh, the Conservation Commission, um, likewise followed and then um, Ms. Chapnick is correct that I submitted a, the applicant's response to that. And there were a couple on there um, that I, I think that it, it was a little bit unclear whether um, there, there was a statement perhaps within, um, I can't remember if it was the commissions or if it was the beta saying, um, we recommend that it be denied, it meets the standards. And, and I wasn't certain if that was a typo meaning we recommend that it be withdrawn, that it's not, you know, that it meets the standards, therefore not necessary. Um, and so within our written response that we provided on the second, uh, we attempted to address that and, and just point out uh, where we may need clarification. Um, so if I can kind of do a quick little walkthrough on, on some of those. So um, relative to the, um, we had asked for, uh, waivers of, of certain jurisdictional or, or definitional, um, because sometimes a board may do it one way or the other. You can, um, so we had asked, for instance, for um, the aura to count as a resource area. So rather than ask for a waiver under the aura provisions, we just asked that it be waived as a resource area. So we had, we had crafted our waiver list both ways. Um, and it, it seems both from Beta and from the commission that they would probably prefer to do it the second way, so not waive the definitions. And, and I think that that's fine. Um, and to Ms. Chapnick's point, um, the, the, like the definitional, definitionals under, I think it's section two or section four of the bylaws, but those could go by the wayside. Um, and then with respect to sections 23, 24, and 25 of the local bylaw, that, that's when I'd indicated previously that I wasn't entirely clear um, what was being, um, what the suggestion of the comment was. Was it that it met it and therefore the waiver was unnecessary? Um, in, in which case I think the, the board can make a determination and be like, you don't need this, it's not necessary, you need it. Um, and you know, to take us back a bit in time, a, a long period of time actually, um, Paul Haverty had said at one point in response or in an explanation of the waiver list that sometimes the board looks at two types of waivers, more process waivers 
and more um, kind of substantive waivers of local bylaw. And, you know, obviously the comprehensive permit is a master permit. So um, you don't really need the process waiver. And, and I had agreed with him on that, but um, sometimes it's a belt and suspenders. We include those kind of process waivers, if you will, um, just to make certain that the board understands that it is issuing everything as a master permit. And, you know, there's, it's very clear that there's no condition that says, and now you have to go back to conservation commission and get a local order of conditions um, for, for work within the order or what have you. Um, and so uh, moving on to, as I suggested, 23, 24, and 25. Um, so Beta's comment for uh, section 23, which is uh, land subject to flooding, um, it's, uh, Beta didn't recommend granting a waiver um, because it says the current design meets the intent of the resource area, presumption of significance, and compliance with the regulation can be met. Um, and, and so for that one, I, I think that we agree that we have met it. Um, and as you, if you look at our waiver list, we've said, um, you know, the explanation is uh, we ask for it to be waived, limited work in floodplains to be shown on project plans, floodplain compensatory storage shown uh, at ratio of two to one. Um, and, and so it, it's more of a process waiver. So if, if we're all in agreement that we don't need to seek process waivers, we can withdraw that. Um, under section 24, that was vegetation removal and replacement performance standards. And um, here it says that beta does not recommend granting a waiver, um, but then it but then it goes on. Beta's peer review went on to say that the project provides habitat restoration at two to one floodplain compensation and also provides habitat restoration of the rare acreage that will remain undeveloped. Such restoration efforts should follow the guidance provided in section 24. Um, it's a little ambiguous to, to the applicant what that means exactly, um, and so. I, I think that it, we're put in a in a in an in an odd position. Do we continue to request the waiver? Um, because I'm not quite certain what that means, what the guidance of Section 24 really means. Um, and in our response that we submitted on the second, we um, we somewhat point that out. Um, and uh, also looking at the commission's letter on that same section, section 24. Uh, the commission confirmed in its letter that the project as proposed, including two to one compensatory flood storage, vegetation mitigation and habitat restoration is in compliance with these regulations. Um, and so uh, again, on one comment they're saying, to, you know, we don't recommend granting the waiver. And then the other comment saying it's in compliance. So if it's, if the statement is that the waiver is not necessary, um, then we'll accept that and um, it can be withdrawn. But if they're saying deny the waiver um, and then make the project adhere to some form of standards that we're not clear on, we would like to know that at the, at the get-go. Um, and then lastly, I think was under section 25 and that's uh, the aura. And Beta's comment letter um, noted that the, um, the various uh, work and, and, and mitigation and, and design of the project will provide a benefit to the board's ability to protect the presumed resource, presumed interest it protects, it provides. Um, but then it went on to say that um, it's unclear whether they meant to deny it or to meant that it wasn't required once again, as we point out in our letter of September 2nd. Um, so maybe um, before I explain further, um, perhaps we could get some input from Beta as to what their recommendation was, um, specifically, I think, towards sections 24 and 25 of the uh, requested waivers of the wetlands by law. I'd be happy to um, hear um, Beta's input. I also will still have some comments too, but Mar Marty, did sure. you want to? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, on section 24, the vegetation removal and replacement performance standards, um, our position is um, that 
we were not recommending that the waiver be granted because of the significant restoration uh, component of this project, one being the floodplain re, um, mitigation area, as well as the, um, the 12 acres outside the project limits that will be um, basically restored. Um, the bylaw provides very specific requirements for um, vegetation uh, removal and, and replacement. And we feel it's important that that particular bylaw um, performance standard remain in place to make sure that um, going forward, the um, work is conducted um, to meet those, those requirements. The um, upland, um, adjacent upland resource area um, waiver entirely, uh, again, our position was that um, it, the waiver um, shouldn't be granted because it because the project currently meets um, the intent of, uh, of that resource and performance standards. Um, but um, what that waiver does is basically it, it, it eliminates the, the uh, pre presumed significance of the aura. And um, you know, this project will be uh, before the Conservation Commission at some point um, and may have gone through some changes at that point. And it just, it just um, provides the commission some, some flexibility with, um, with that particular resource area in case there's further encroachment into it. Um, you know, again, it's up to, uh, obviously the Conservation Commission's input is very important on this, on this matter. Um, but we wanted to be consistent with the, um, the, the other 40B in town um, and, and follow our, our recommendations um, as we presented um, them in that case. So, um, you know, the, the applicant didn't provide any real hardships um, for these particular sections of the, of the regulations and bylaw to remain in place. Um, so therefore, um, you know, we feel that um, waivers are not needed. Mr. Chairman, if I could quickly respond um, to a couple of points there. Um, the, um, I, I believe that Marty had said that she was worried about um, waiving the presumption of significance as to the aura. Um, that's not really a performance standard, that's a presumption. Um, and, and kind of the other point of that though, and maybe I didn't fully explain it before, but when this project does go before the Conservation Commission, it's going to be solely under the Wetlands Protection Act, and it's not going to be under the local wetlands bylaw, and the aura is not applicable. It will be work in the buffer zone potentially, but it's not work in the aura. Um, and, um, and then in terms of just the keeping consistency with projects, um, as I noted in my comment letter on the second, under section 24, the commission actually had recommended um, withdrawal of the waiver request for 24 because um, I believe it said that it, um, it says that the project was in compliance and recommended withdrawal under section 24. So if, if we're talking consistency, um, there, there's a little bit of inconsistency there. Um, and, and so I think that perhaps on both of those fronts, the applicant needs to retain its waiver request for the board's consideration. Um, uh, you know, in, under section 24, we've proposed, we're, and again, um, just so the board understands, when we request a waiver, we're requesting the waiver for the work shown on the plan. So it's not to say that we're going to do things willy-nilly. Um, it's, it's, it's tied into the project plans that we're asking the board to approve. Um, and uh, so we would keep both of those waiver requests for sections 24 and, and for sections 25. And, and again, just a reminder that when this project comes before the Conservation Commission, it's under the WPA and, and not the local bylaw. Chairman Klein, may I respond? Ms. Chapman, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, for, for the other 40B, just for clarification, uh, the Conservation Commission did recommend that the applicant withdraw their request for waivers for 24 and 25 in that instance. 
And the reasoning was we had much more detailed planting plans, much more detail on moving a uh, stormwater feature um, than we have for this project. The other reason for that is that we also um, proposed a special condition. I understand the, the conditions are still draft, but there was a sp special condition that it requires the applicant when they present the project as a, a notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act to the Conservation Commission that they address all the vegetation replacement issues that are in section 24E. So it has that as a special condition that upon coming to the Conservation Commission, the applicant will provide that detailed information for review. Um, under the Wetlands Protection Act, as you said, there's the buffer zone. It's not a resource area, but it is a protected area. Um, there are also other issues in the act that need to protect, be protected, wildlife habitat, which has to do with tree removal, et cetera, as you understand. So, so there are other, other tools that we have, let's say, um, for reviewing this information. Okay. And, and I have some specific questions about certain plans, but I don't know if you want to get off the waiver topic yet. So I guess what I heard is that the applicant is willing to withdraw the waiver for the aura definition. That was the, 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 the first one that was discussed by Ms. Kiefer and for the land subject to flooding, but they are not willing to, to withdraw the waivers for section 24 for um, section 25 and the conservation commission agrees with beta that these waivers should be denied okay thank you yeah if we could move off of the waivers that'd be good okay um may I, may i um make two comments on some of the updated plans sure okay thank you um Updated plans included um, bioretention uh, area and rain garden, as well as an adjacent woodland restoration area, um, which talked about um, tree removal and vegetation replacement, et cetera. Um, the Conservation Commission doesn't have enough information in the packet to really tell if this stormwater feature, the bioretention rain garden would be viable. Um, we don't have the detail on, on uh, the composition of the amended soil. Um, the wetland seed mix may work on the bottom where it's wet, but wouldn't necessarily work on the slopes or upland. Um, the woodland restoration, though we appreciate that it discusses approval by a landscape architect and a wildlife ecologist. Um, we, we think there should be uh, additional review or requirement, such as a special condition that the board um, approve any uh, vegetation removal and planting plans in these areas, as well as invasive management um, plans for these areas. Those are consistent with special conditions that we have drafted for the other 40B. Thank you. Good. Are there questions from the board in regards to the many things we've seen? Mr. Revelak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a few questions. Uh, one is um, regarding the bicycle shed. Uh, so I Will the shed be covered? That's first. And uh, will the, I mean, the bicycle parking area in general be secured? Um, so like a, a lock gate or that sort of thing. Uh, Ms. Kiefer, do you have a? Uh, I, I will answer it and anyone, um, perhaps uh, Scott, if you want to clarify anything, but yes, it will be covered and yes, it will be secured. Okay. Um, 
if you if you want any further details probably scott was is your person to respond to that but no no there's um, um, those are those are easy questions yeah well you know for like um my you know my point in asking it was to make sure it was suitable for storing uh bicycles outside during inclement weather and it sounds like it will be yes um okay perfect um now the overview letter uh, mentions that this the independent living facility will be for uh, residents of age 62 plus so that will be the minimum age of residents living there yes okay and um, let's see with respect to the you know traffic we are you know I, it seems it sounds like that we agree or there is agreement that uh, this configuration will generate fewer trips relative to the um, relative to the 176 unit apartment in the earlier iteration. So does it for peak traffic, it really breaks down to about one vehicle, one additional vehicle every two to three minutes. Is, is that a, is that about right? Yeah, that's about correct. Okay, great. And a uh, final question with respect to uh, the waiver request for Title V, Article 8, Section 11. This is uh, the bonding uh, for you know, work in flood prone areas, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if the Conservation Commission had any um, thoughts or could provide an estimate of what such a bond would be and uh, how they feel about whether, whether that waiver should be granted. Ms. Chapnick? If you're available to answer that. She may have stepped away. Well, if she's not long, no longer available, let's, um, you know, as long as it, it would be nice to have an have I believe it would be nice to have an answer at some point, but it doesn't necessarily need to be this very moment. Uh, I have nothing further, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Questions from the board, Chairman. Please, uh, um, Ms. Kiefer. While the minimum age uh, is sixty-two, I gather. Um, I'm trying to get a, there, there have been various estimates or that, um, as to how old on average the residents are apt to be. And I, I understand that, uh, that is just a, a projection and, and nobody knows for sure who it is you're going to attract to the complex. Um, but at one point, I think, uh, uh, your expert uh, who testified on the 29th uh, said it would be people in their 60s and 70s um, uh, who were in pretty good health. Uh, I think at some point in one of your papers, Ms. Kiefer, you said mid 70s to 90s. Um, and as somebody who has a certain amount of experience with some of that range, I can tell you that it sounds like only a few years, but it makes a pretty big difference in your style of life. Um, and I'm w wondering if when you if focusing on that, you you have any better estimate of just of just how old do you expect these people to be? Uh, I, I believe that, and I may uh, pull in uh, either uh, Bob Angler or, or Glennon Art. Um, but I, I think that the kind of that range of what we were had, had said before, like really more of a mid 70s to 90s, potentially, um, you know, with, with age restricted housing, you usually have two kind of categories, but 55 plus or 62 plus. So this would be like, so the 62 plus is our option, you know, because there's obviously it's not going to be a 55 plus. It's not going to try, it's not designed for people that are 55 pluses. And, you know, 62 plus, maybe there's some people that are 62, but, um, you know, what we're being told by our experts that, that design these um, is it's, it's really an older population than that. And um, I don't, Art and Gwen, if you want to add anything to that response, um, unmute yourself and. 
be fine. No, you're, if you're speaking, you're muted. I, I think they're looking for the unmute button. There we go. <laughs> Andy, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, we have been uh, going from what a possible uh, uh, operator has said that his sense of the market is. And of course, um, things fluctuate with with markets, uh, as we know, and there and the addition of of a new facility will change the way an existing facility might might uh, find their the, the the people coming to 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 each one would happen. Anyway, what we were told earlier was that it was likely that this facility in this location with with the cluster of other facilities in the area, it was likely that it would be people in their in their 70s and 80s, even more in their 80s, that would that would be attracted to this community. And that's that was just not a scientific uh, um, statement, but one of a, a, a marketing uh, evaluation. And I appreciate whatever Bob Angler might add to this because he's in this in this business all the time. Bob? Any thoughts, Bob? Mr. Angler? Yes. <clears throat> can you hear me? We can. I'm not an expert. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm the president of uh, a nonprofit that, you know, owns and operates a facility like this, but that's just one example. I think the mid 80s is what we're looking at more or less. And bear in mind, the range is still there. You could try and pick an average, but you'll have people at the lower range and from 70 to the upper range of 90, but it might be fall somewhere in the mid 80s, uh, given given what how people are living these days. So that's as close as I can come to an estimate. And I think that's, you know, that's what you plan for. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. And it depends on, excuse me, it depends also on, on the people's health, as we all know. So a, a very healthy 89 year old is, is better off there than a, somebody who's pretty frail at, at 70. So again, that's why the health is a component just as much as the age, more so perhaps because the age really doesn't matter, but it's the, it's the health and how they can live in the environment. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask Mr. Roach. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, if in fact we're dealing with a population that's largely in their 70s and even possibly more in their 80s, then I take it, it's true, isn't it, that the ITE classification, um, senior housing attached, is looking at um, 55 plus, is that right? Yeah, I believe that's how I, ITE defines it. And so, so the analysis that we've provided in our opinion is, is, is conservative in that sense. Because the, the, the other land use code is a, is a congregate care facility, which would match more of the older um, people with more services and whatnot. That, that has a lower trip generation rate than, than the senior housing attached does. Okay, so if I, I mean, it's it's going to be conservative, forgetting for the moment the health of older people that lots of people from 55 to 65 say are still in the labor force and are more likely to be commuting, which is what the uh, which is which is what the peak generation is likely to be about. Um, and if you're dealing with people in their later 70s or their 80s. Uh, you do like me, you still work, but you've given up on getting paid for it. Um, and so I'm guessing that it's a pretty substantial conservative, conservative bias there. Uh, but I take it your view is still that even when people are doing any, some commuting, at least some of them are not going to do it by automobile and that justifies at least the minimum haircut you've given for mode split, which I noticed that you've really cut back on compared to the uh, what is being done for the for the duplex units is is that a fair statement of your approach yeah i would say that summarizes it quite well and if you look i mean we, we are only looking at things that are new but 
I was impressed actually in looking at the uh, at when you take the trip generation and put fold it back into the predictions of the growth of traffic and what's already there, um, that uh, not only is this not that different from the 176, but that uh, it has, with the exception possibly of uh, the intersection at Little John and, and Lake Street, uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference one way or the other. So dealing with these trip generation assumptions uh, is not the sort of thing that moves the needle very much in quantifying the amount of impact the development may have on the on the traffic. Is, is that a fair statement of your exhibit? Well, I, I would say what, 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 we're, what we're seeing is, is that the amount of traffic that either one of these specific facilities that we've looked at over the traffic that's there in the no build condition is, is insignificant. Um, if you put a, a, a massive, you know, warehouse or retail facility there or something like that, then, then you might, you know, <laughs> the, the numbers would be different. But in, in comparison of, of these two facilities, the chip generation isn't, isn't that significantly different and therefore the effect of the, the, the trips on the surrounding area are, are very similar. Okay, um, thanks. I have two other questions, but there, uh, one of them I think is appropriately addressed to Ms. Chapnick if she's still, if she's back, but if not, um, my, maybe to Ms. Kiefer. Uh, we've had a discussion about waivers and a, a lot of that is the sort of thing that only lawyers can be interested in. Um, but as I sort of look at where things are and leaving aside the question as to whether or not pro plans are detailed enough and whether we need to be uh, uh, seeing what kind of further review might be appropriate down the road. Um, essentially everything, uh, that the proposal we have before us is in every respect, essential respect, I think, in compliance with our local bylaw. And if that's not true, I'd like it to be highlighted exactly where there's a non-compliance. Because most of the discussions about waivers are is focusing on whether or not you need a waiver when you're complying. Uh, and it seems to me the big story there is that we've come a long way uh, from a year and a half ago uh, in terms of uh, really enforcing the town's wetlands bylaw. And I just wonder if either of you uh, would disagree with that. Mr. Chapman? Oh, I can't hear you now. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> now now yes. we can yes yes uh, sorry um i i agree with you uh, mr hanlon um that's why i was proposing at least on section 25 which is the aura i think that the applicant based on the revised plans meets the intent of the aura and if this project came up to the conservation commission it, it would, we do allow some, some intrusion on the outer 25 feet of the aura with mitigation, um, such as uh, mitigation plantings and things like that. And I think that this project meets that. In terms of section 24, the vegetation, the problem is that um, there's not enough information um, to see if it meets the bylaw or not. And so I see two ways of dealing with that. Um, one is um, we put in a special condition that says that the applicant must provide X, Y, and Z, and that's what we did for the other 40B, um, and it needs to be approved by the CBA, you know, um, but the, the, other, the other way is, is to ask for that information now, and the other way is, is what the applicant has done, which is ask for a waiver of those. Um, bylaw provisions, which the Conservation Commission and BETA recommend not up approving um, for the reasons that Marty gave earlier. 
Thanks, Susan. St Stephanie, do you, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure, thank you uh, for the opportunity. So with, re with respect to, um, I guess I'll go in, in the order of the last stated one first, um, the vegetation removal and replacement. Um, if, if I heard Ms. Chapnick correctly, she was suggesting um, deny it and then impose some conditions. And um, there had been a, gosh, so many moons ago, there had been a hearing though, and I think Paul had given the board kind of a, a good little primer on um, waivers. And, and um, Paul, cut me off if I'm misstating what you said, but it was basically the board can consider a waiver request. And sometimes they decide to grant a waiver and it, it may be, you know, subject to, you know, there, there's a condition that, you know, well, okay, so it's not like it's, it's going crazy or, or you know, and um, so, Denying it and then imposing conditions is, um, I'm not quite certain like what that serves you because then you've denied um, what has been requested. And so um, I, I, again, I, I think right. that the, the waiver of request is appropriate, that it's subject to um, the, the plans and, and the landscaping plan. And then if the board feels that there's a need for additional conditioning, um, you know, we're happy to discuss that. Um, one thing I would just caution the board and, and Paul probably has because he's an excellent attorney is just that the board doesn't want to impose any um, what's known as condition subsequent. So that requires the applicant right. to after they get the permit to, to do that. So um, so I'm not gonna do Paul's work, work for him. He's, he's well, Mr. Yeah, well Paul does a great process. job. I just wanted to, I wanted to step back to the essence of it, Matt, because I mean, we're talking here about what the nature of a condition might be, what additional details might be necessary in order to show that the applicant is carrying through in the appropriate way to the kinds of commitments that it's already made. And I understand those are important issues, but to me, it's more important that we're, you're just, we're mostly dealing with means here and that at the end of the day, there's not a huge disagreement that people, that, that the, we'll figure out, Mr. Haverty will figure out and we'll all applaud him for doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we've, we've reduced that distance down to uh, a matter of more legal technicalities than, uh, than substance. Um, I had one co final question, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and that, I guess, uh, I'll, I think it's to Mr. Hessian, or maybe uh, Ms. Kiefer, um, and I have to apologize for being uh, kind of a pest about this, but over the course of many hearings, we have touched on the question why it is exactly this development uh, can be expected with reasonable assurance not to exacerbate the flooding that is experienced um, in the neighborhood. And I know we've also talked about the flooding on the property in particular, but here I want to focus on, on the neighborhood. And I was wondering if, if it would be possible for you, uh, for our next hearing, to just gather together a summary of that argument, the sort of thing, Ms. Kiefer, if if you were dealing with the judge who asked for proposed uh, findings of fact that you would put in that just brings it all together. So I don't mean additional re research or anything like that. I mean, really essentially marshalling what's been said already and bringing it together so we can look at it and say, well, this is the case. And if you could do that and Mr. McGrath could review it and say he's persuaded or if not, tell us why. Um, that would make it really help. That would be really be helpful when we get into this, to uh, conditions at the next hearing, and you know, sort of understanding clearly why it all is. It seems to me that it relates partly to the stormwater, which Mr. McGrath has already addressed. Um, it also it might relate to why it is there's flooding now that may have to do with inadequate drainage. Uh, through the systems the town already has. And obviously there have been questions raised about groundwater and the possibility that uh, some sort of, of groundwater seeping is, is causing the problem. But whatever it is, I think that the neighbors and the, and the commission and the board needs to 
be clear on exactly what the arguments are and uh, and be able to if may pass a judgment um, as to whether we think that that there's a risk and if so uh, whether what how big a risk that is. So again, I, I'm not looking for uh, you know thousands of dollars of new research, but just sort of marshalling it all together so that we can see it. Uh, without going through 20 hearings and and have it in writing so we can look at it and say, well, this is what it is. And we don't have to, again, look at all of the great material that ACMI gives us. Um, and I appreciate it if, that, if you would find that's reasonable and can bring that together. It's sort of, it's a mini version of restating something, I guess. Uh, I think, and, and John may be upset at me for, for saying this, but, but um, if just to give you a, uh, a a quick feedback on that, John, if you're prepared just to hit the, the highlights to uh, give Mr. Hanlon a, a quick response on, on the elements there. And I know that he he he, he put forth some of them in his question itself. So yeah, I, I, I sort of, you know, I do know where I really am kind of very eager to have something in writing because you can't, I mean, this is just a moment going back and recovering this moment means looking at the ICMI tape and finding exactly where it took place and so on. It's, it's, it's hard to deal with what's said in the oral hearing and it would be a lot easier if this were more like a post-trial brief and you, we were able to look at it and have it summarized. And then if we need to go back and look at the specific hearing, it would be better. Because I know I've asked this question to Mr. Hessian before, um, maybe a bunch of times, and it would take me a long, long time to go back and find all the places where he's addressed it. So do we not want a, a high level, um, or do we want to save it for a written I would, I, well, the board should say what it wants. I yeah, personally yeah. would like to have a written thing and not spend, I mean, time tonight is pretty valuable and I'd like to move on if we, if we can, but if others would like to have the overview, that, that would be fine with me anyway. I agree with Mr. Hamlin. Yes, yeah, so we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll request that in writing and we'll, we'll move on. Anything further, Mr. Hanlon? Nope, that's it for me, thank you. Other questions from the board? I have a few. Um, most of them are have already been addressed in some fashion. Uh, so one was the question about the rain garden, um, so the, the bioswale feature, um, which Ms. Chapnick had mentioned earlier. Um, it would be helpful if we could get a little more definition as to um, to exactly what that is, so we can have some assurance as to its its functionality. I'm especially concerned because it is immediately adjacent to um, an abutting neighbor, and so I just want to make sure that uh, whatever is being proposed for that is going to uh, that we have some assurance that it's going to function in the manner that we're we're anticipating and will not be causing an impact on the adjacent neighbor. Um, on the question of bike parking, um, so the the shelter and the, the racks, I think, are, are very good for bicycles. Obviously, people, as they age, a lot of people transition from bicycles to trikes, uh, to tricycles, which have a more larger footprint. Um, and the question I had had, uh, it's probably a question for Mr. Vla uh, Mr. Vlasic, um, on the basement plan, the, the garage floor plan, at the extreme right, there is a uh, labeled out common area. And I was curious what that space is allocated for. Sure. So um, I, I think it's not really well defined yet. That common area on the garage level is kind of um, also related to other common areas that exist on the first on the ground floor plan and the second floor plan. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not well defined. Um, I think that it, so it would be reasonable to say that um, it wouldn't be out of the question that some of that area could be potentially used for that. Um, there also that reserve parking area that's in the garage at the lower left corner that um, is more or less an open, you know, striped area that could also be used for that purpose. And there's other striped areas around the garage. We kind of wanted to designate one area just to have, you know, 
a spot for it. Um, but as you look around the garage plan, there are other striped areas that aren't quite big enough for parking spaces um, that could certainly be used for what you're suggesting, a larger uh, footprint for a, a dricycle. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the common area had stood out to me because it appears that there is a ramp up to grade. And so that would be yes. for that purpose. Okay. Yep. Agreed. Um, there was a note um, in the comments from the Department of Planning and Community Development um, that uh, Lake Street is currently signed for no heavy trucking. Um, and so I was curious, um, thinking forward, not necessarily to the construction phase, but to the operations phase, um, is there any concern on behalf of the um, the management team that they would be able to operate this facility without the need for heavy trucks. I'll let Art respond, but I believe the response is there's no concern that we would need heavy trucks. And um, we, had, we had talked about before in terms of uh, deliveries and whatnot to the facility, um, we could, you know, we can really define that through management, you know, through timing and, and, and even through sizing probably of, of the truck. So um, Art, if I've misstated, please jump in and correct me. No, I agree with that. We, we as Gwen mentioned, we've talked to a potential uh, one in particular that might might be interested in, in managing this project. And uh, they he feels quite confident that not only can you control the size of trucks, but you can even control the time they deliver things. In other words, keep it off hours 10, between 10 and three, something like that. So. I think he's fairly confident. But but the size of the of the vehicles that would be delivering food or bread or whatever um, can be smaller van type size, not large trucks. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there was a comment in from the again from the Department of Planning and Community Development uh, regarding um, the finished coloration on the townhouse units um, because the all six units have the, uh, the same three proposed colors. And they were looking for a little more variation in color similar to so the remainder of the neighborhood has a lot of variation in color. And I was curious um, if it if the applicant could consider, um, so currently there's like a yellow accent color that occurs throughout. Would it be possible to maintain the, the gray and the red in all those buildings, but then that yellow color may vary from building to building. So that some might be, you know, yellow, but some might be a different shade or a different color, uh, just to provide a little bit of variation. I, I, I think we'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. I, the, the 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 color consideration will go through a, a lot more thought. Uh, the uh, it, it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the, I understand that there were three test pits that were installed last year. Is there, has there been any continued monitoring of those test pits or were they just sort of a one-time check? Um, they were a one-time test pit. There were no monitoring wells installed when those were completed in November. Okay. Um, there was a question that was uh, raised by um, our, our traffic consultant regarding the circle in the middle of the turnaround um, in front of the building and whether that was something that was uh, going to be raised or whether it was going to be something that could be driven over. And I was curious if you had an opinion on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, sorry, I just spoke up the last question you asked, uh, John Hessian. Um, that will be a flush um, surface, likely a paver or cobblestone type of treatment to just to differentiate the interior part of the circle, but it cannot be raised or planted. There was a little artistic license taken in the colored site plan that was not accurate. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then the last question, so I know there's a waiver um, in regards to Arlington's inclusionary zoning bylaw, which currently requires that any residential development with six or more units to provide 15% of their units at 70% AMI. 
Um, and because this project is being proposed under 40B, it is the subsidizing agency um, has an agreement that it will be 25% of units at 80% AMI. Um, and I, there was a couple of questions sort of back and forth about what the implication is of Arlington's inclusionary zoning bylaw being in effect while this project goes forward under 40B. Um, and so I had uh, spoken to a couple of different people. Um, and it was recommended that possibly um, I ask Mr. Engler this question because he has a little more experience in regards to how some of these projects are funded, um, especially through the state agencies, as to um, how that would be possibly handled by a subsidizing agency. I don't know if Mr. Engler is available to us. Bob, are you there? Can you hear me? We can. Oh. Um, it's, if the request, it's a different issue. The request by this by the town has got different ratios than what the, the state requires, and it's up to the applicant to say whether they can afford that or not. We would say we cannot. It makes the project more uneconomic to go take ten percent off the rents or fifteen percent of the units, and that takes a lot of work to show that and have some consultant review it, etc. But that's our position that the state agency requires what they do and we meet that and they don't they don't ask for anything more than that. So the town can ask for it. If some applicants could provide it, great. We're not in a position having reduced what we've done uh, to be able to do that. Okay. All right, thank you. Chairman, can I speak to that? Mr. Haverty, please. Well, Bob, it's my understanding that Mass Housing generally requires eligibility to be at 80% area median income, but then for the units to be priced based upon the 70% area median income, am I not correct about that? They used to, uh, Paul, they used to be able to set them at 70. Some years ago, they allowed applicants to go right to 80% because of the, you know, that cost. I mean, they still show that in their little formula for selling units, but I have not seen that in rental housing all the developments that I've done uh, are at 80% and the, and the state agencies have all accepted that. So there's no requirement to go to 70. Okay, so then at minimum, there's gonna to need to be a modification to the waiver request to include that waiver. It's in there. It's in there, okay. It is yeah. in there, yeah. All right. Thank you both on that. Uh, those were the outstanding questions I had. Um, one last call to the board for questions and comments. Looking around, everyone looks satisfied. Okay, so it is 9.22. Um, so in a moment, I'm gonna open up the public comment period on the revised design for the proposed project. Uh, public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. The board strongly encourages the introduction of new information as there's a strong record of comment on topics discussed at prior hearings. To provide an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair asks that individual public speakers please limit their comments to less than five minutes. Additional time may be provided at the discretion of the chair to provide time for questions to be addressed. Um, the procedure for <clears throat> excuse me, requesting to speak will be the same as for previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address for the record. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the ch chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed for this session of the hearing. I would like to conclude this evening's hearing um, sort of in the 10.30, 10.45 range. So I'd like to close the public comment period no later than an hour from now, which is not, would be 10.23 PM. And the board and staff will do our best to show uh, sections of drawings um, or any other documents that you would like to have discussed. Um, so with that, let me quickly start a speaker list. 
Um, so, um, Ms. Brown. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Please Excellent. go ahead. Um, question for you. Since I am actually in the process of putting my 85 and 91 year old parents into assisted living, this is a topic that's close to my uh, current experience level. And what I'm not understanding and what I probably missed in some of the documents is I don't understand what their care and management model is. Are they doing meals? Is there going to be an on-site manager? Um, is there going to be somebody who is um, directing care in the building? Or is this just apartment living and everybody's on their own? I'm not, because I, I heard somebody earlier talking about food truck deliveries and things like that. So are there meals being served? Is there some kind of organized care? Is there a, a, a director on site? Thank you, Ms. Kiefer. Can you address that question? You're on mute, sorry. I apologize for that. Um, so the uh, the development, it's not assisted living, it is gonna be independent living with services. Um, and I, I believe in one of our submission, we um, kind of outlined uh, basically the, the type of services, but there will be um, an operator on site and there will be, um, uh, assistance with scheduling doctor's visits, whatnot. Um, I think maybe Art, if I could pull you back on, um, I, I think you gave a, a good brief cursory um, just to re-hit the points of what will be provided um, or what is expected to be. The, uh, I think a critical thing is that there will be a, uh, an organized dinner every night. And there'll be a, a wait staff coming in the mid afternoon. There'll be cooks coming in mid afternoon. Uh, one of the issues that came up, they will not be uh, coming to peak hours. Uh, and uh, dinner will be served available to anybody who would like to, to join. They don't, they're not forced to join. It's not part of the program, but uh, it's an option. So that's a, a major thing. There are two people there, uh, I think, during the entire day. Uh, and uh, they're there to help, they're there to support, they're there to uh, uh, make sure everything is running smoothly. And there are a lot of activities. I think uh, one of those people uh, probably would be uh, involved in having organizing activities. Gwen, you may want to give to you in a minute to add something to that. And then there's a jitney van. And I think one of the things that uh, is, is really an amenity for people is that the van can take people to different places to enjoy uh, different amenities in, in the community. Do anyone have anything to add? Well, yes, I'd like to say that, first of all, we're, we are talking about what an experienced operator was giving his best judgment as to how this would, would be uh, organized. And he did include that there'd be an exercise room and as well as some kind of um, uh, medical uh, Examination, um, examination space so that, that, that somebody could get a certain amount of, of uh, medical assistance or advice on site. But again, we, we haven't got an operator up and running and, and we we're, what we're trying to do is to provide the space for a program that works. So yeah, you can see by the amount of common area space we have in the building, and if you look at the plans, it's, it's much larger than a normal apartment building, which would be exa examination rooms, would be uh, uh, sort of office space for any kind of board meeting that uh, somebody might be, be involved in or business positions or whatever. He talked about so, a country kitchen that where you could have, you know, somebody who was, you know, being able to do a cooking class and that kind of stuff. So, but there is some information like that as part of our presentation in detail. Right. It, so just basically to recap, there's it, it's not assisted living, but there are services and there's um, social outlets. There's um, there's staff that's available. There's a jitney that's available. Um, and as Art pointed out, um, there, there's an, a there's a, a large amount of community space that um, once the operator comes on, they kind of like 
more tailor it to what they need. So okay. I hope that was responsive. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, just one last follow-up question. So I, I looked on the plans, but I didn't see a dining room space or common area space that I would think of as being able to serve 150, 200 people meals. Did I miss that in the plans? Um, Ms. Keeper or no, Mr. Lassick? Uh, well, I, I could answer that. Scott can answer for a minute. But uh, the reason we didn't detail laying out dining rooms or kitchens or uh, any kind of rooms at all is that, that different operators will do it a different way. They'll all provide the same services, but one may want a kitchen here, one there, whatever. So we just blocked out the common space, which is shown in the drawing as, as a light green. Uh, but the, uh, the the dining room that we would probably do, I don't know, Scott, you might want to say something. This be on the southern side, would we'll be right next to a large porch, which would look out over the um, over the uh, abutting mm -hmm. woodland. woodland. Scott, do you want to add anything? Classic? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Art. I think uh, you summarized it pretty well, but I thought it might just be helpful to quickly. Um, I just shared my screen so that we can just, you know, indicate where exactly it is that you're talking about. So on the ground floor plan, which is here, um, the, the green shaded area that Art is referring to is right in the center of the building here. There's also additional uh, common area that you see on the second floor plan. So really those are the spaces that would be defined and specifically what Art was just referring to is uh, with respect to the dining room, a preferred location, depending on what the operator ultimately decides might be this area here, which is on the south side. Um, this porch area that's being contemplated, um, you know, might be a nice complement to uh, a dining room where you'd actually be able to go outside um, afterwards. Um, so, thank you. Anything further, Ms. Brown? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next is a phone-in caller with the number ending in six four four. You go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, please. Yes, five, five six, four, four. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, name and address Moore, for the record. Uh, yeah, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, um, my question is this, that it, it, generally the two main issues currently between uh, the neighborhood and, the, and the, the development, I think the neighborhood's concerns are traffic and flooding and perhaps density on the site. Um, and I know that there was a brief mention during uh, one of the presentations about uh, deciding when to do, when to measure the, uh, the flow, the groundwater flow from runoff and such, uh, and, and how, you know, should we do it during a high water time or regular water time, an average time, those sorts of issues. And, um, I have to say, considering it's it's one of the largest concerns here, I would suggest perhaps consideration be given. And I don't know, I, I mean, I'm not an engineer and I'm not um, uh, cognizant of the cost of doing this, but this building in terms of mitigation of groundwater and flood control be over-designed instead of designed to whatever the particular flow measurements show because we're now in this period of climate change experiencing more like um, 100 year events every five or 10 years and thousand year events every 100 years. And I'm thinking perhaps designing to a higher standard would mitigate the concern and potential impact of this development on the area. We're removing a significant amount of trees <laughs> that aren't necessarily you know, glorious examples of trees, but trees you know, help control floodplain water and, and, um, and removing the vegetation, be it invasive or not, is removing vegetation and replacing it with vegetation um, certainly is the right thing to do, but vegetation controls uh, flooding and, and flood water control. So I would make one last uh, Hail Mary pitch to over designing the flood control of this to mitigate the fact that flooding 
is going to be, it just feels intuitively is going to be an outcome of this development. So thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, just ask Mr. Hessian to just briefly comment on, um, I know the we had requested uh, specifically that the applicant use a higher um, rainfall predictive model than um, is currently um, in common usage. I just wanted to ask you to just briefly touch on that. And is there any relation between that figure and uh, the flood elevation? And you're on mute. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I could touch on a, a, on a couple of things to identify where this project is, you know, designing to a higher standard. Um, under 40B, this project is required to be designed to for stormwater to the to Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, we originally designed the stormwater, uh, the drainage system to meet the local Arlington local wetland regulations, which requires a more intense um, rainfall precipitation event than the state does. And since that, since that time, we've increased the precipitation data to um, kind of at the request of the Conservation Commission to use the NOAA 14 plus data, which the state Commonwealth of Massachusetts is looking to potentially adopt. Um, additionally, with respect to compensatory flood storage under the Wetlands Protection Act, the state standards, um, compensatory storage is required at a one-to-one -one, um, ratio. The local Arlington wetland regulations require a two-to-one. So in meeting the two-to-one, we're, we're exceeding the, you know, the minimum requirement of the state standard. And then lastly, um, it's been quite some time, but we looked at um, we were asked to look at the city of Cambridge. You know, Arlington doesn't have advanced uh, flood modeling, but the city of Cambridge does. And directly across Route 2, we looked at the 2070 sea level rise, storm surge, flood event in, you know, in this area. And it would raise the 100 year floodplain from 6.8 to approximately 11, so about four feet. And we've designed the finished floors of all of the buildings to be, the duplexes are one foot above that, 2070 um, sea level rise, flood elevation. Um, the finished floor is set at elevation 12. And then the, the senior living building is set even higher than that at elevation 16. So um, we do believe that there's been a lot of effort put in over the course of the design and review of this project to, to um, in response to the commenters' questions or, or points to kind of over design or design to a higher standard with respect to stormwater management and, and flooding. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Moore, do you have anything further? Uh, only that, that those comments are helpful to hear, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list, uh, Mr. Krupp. I think I have down is Larry Krupp. Yes. It is, yes. Hi, Larry Krupp. I live over on Fairmont Street. Um, I think anybody who knows this area knows uh, just how congested the roads are. Um, Lake Street and particularly, you know, that whole area is a mess under, under normal conditions. Um, I looked over the traffic numbers and I'm just, I'd like to know on top of that already congested situation, how many additional vehicles will be added to that every day? And what vehicles is that covering? Is it covering, you know, the people who live there? Is it covering, the trucks and service vehicles that come and go, the garbage vehicles. Um, it sounds like there's some uncertainty about exactly what kind of services will be even offered at the location. And if you don't know those services, how, you know, has it covered, how do you know how many employees are gonna work there, et cetera. Um, but is it five, 600 cars a day? Is it, is it more than that? 
Um, if I could uh, direct this question to Mr. Roach. Yes, the current um, numbers that we ran for the trip generation indicate that there'll be uh, around 400 vehicles a day from the site. Total. Is it's that just personal vehicles or is, does that include service vehicles? That includes, so the, the ITE trip generation numbers uh, are, are, are averages of, of, of uh, empirical counts of sites across the country. Um, and so they include all vehicles entering and exiting those sites to create the trip rates that we use. So these numbers would include all of the users of the site. And for a site with this particular population group, is that correct, or is it a, just a? Well, technic technically, 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 as as Mr. Hanlon pointed out, we are we are actually using a trip generation uh, uh, rate that is for land use code that 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 is a higher trip generator than what we would expect this the site to have. So we're actually being conservative. In reality, we would expect that number to be less than four hundred. Thank you, Mr. Crook. If, if I might just follow up for just quickly, that's 400. I'm looking at your report. It looks like there's 474 total trips. Uh, I, you might be home. looking. You might be looking at the original report. There's an updated analysis in an August third letter. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. August third. Yeah, so it should be 412. 412 total from all of the housing units, senior living plus the townhouses. That's correct. And that covers Amazon delivery vehicles and all the other service vehicles, et cetera. Yes, the, like I said, the, the, the trip generations, the trip generate that, the trip rates from ITE are based on empirical counts of, of sites throughout the country and they count every type of vehicle that enters and exits those sites. Mm -hmm. That would include delivery vehicles, workers, residents, visitors. Yeah, so that's so ballpark of 3,000 a week added to an already highly congested area. Not to mention, and that's a neighborhood that's also in a very small neighborhood, right? Not just the general area. Yep. Like that means 3,000 a week, roughly, give or take, turning onto Lake Street, left or right, at intersections where there's no traffic light. Right, that's what we're talking about here. So it would be at Little John, I believe. Yes, yeah, signaled. Yeah, I mean, anybody, <laughs> I would think, at least as a person who lives in the neighborhood, and then you know, presumably some of those cars will turn right and head to Mass Ave, where all the commercial businesses are. Um, yeah, uh, to me, that's that's just a huge number. Well, I think, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to add that, that I think is very important. Sorry, is that Mr. Klipfel? Yeah, is that okay if I just respond to that a little bit? Uh, if you do it through the chair, absolutely. Okay, uh, I will go through the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the trips to this particular facility, uh, which we analyzed, <clears throat> are, are not going to be at peak hours uh, in the majority. There'll be a few people leaving uh, and coming at peak hours, but most of the uh, residents, because it's so hard to get onto Lake Avenue, will choose to go because they have a choice. Most of them, most of them don't commute, as somebody said earlier. So they will leave at 10 or 11 or whatever and come back in the afternoon and try to avoid peak hour. And all the wait staff is uh, not at peak hour. The people that there are about eight uh, people on the wait staff and then three cooks that would probably come and they are all off peak hour. So I think it's important to consider that, that it's not in terms of the Lake Street impact, uh, it's not as great as might be indicated by the number of trips that are measured by these uh, criteria. Thank That's, you. That, that appears to be different from the conclusion in the VAI traffic report of August 3rd. Is the VAI guy here? Can he comment on that? Is that right? The, that the, are you claiming in their report that the vast majority of the, these daily trips would, would be on non-peak hours? Is that right? Mr. Roach? So the ITA trip generation numbers in what we ran in, assumes the trips during the peak hours. What, what Art is, is saying is that in reality, um, based on being able to schedule 
deliveries and uh, set employee shifts that we would be able to shift most of those outside of peak hours. If, if I could speak to this uh, also. <laughs> Lisa, if I can let the, the person who, the person for the public who's calling in, if I can let them speak for a minute, please. Um, Mr. Krupp, uh, did you yeah, have no, any? I actually, I think I see the numbers, how they work in the report. I'm just not sure it makes, uh, so I, I think I get the point here, but it doesn't make logical sense to me. Um, I don't think you have control over when doctor's appointments are scheduled. You've got an aging population, like when my father was at one of these types of facilities for the last 10 years. Um, you know, you've got haircut appointments, you've got doctor's appointments, you've got Amazon trucks. You got all sorts of things you can't control. Yes, the, probably the, the handful or dozen of employees who work there, you might be able to you know, regulate that. You got holidays when people come to visit their elderly loved ones. Um, I'm not sure the assumptions in this are going to end up holding water. I mean, and again, for me, if you know where Fair Fairmont Street is, you know I'm not impacted directly by the turning. You know, I live in a little bit further away, but the poor people who live in that neighborhood are. Yikes, yikes is all I gotta say. Thank you. Um, next on the list um, is Ms. Stamps. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Susan Stamps, I'm on the tree committee and so I had, had a couple of tree questions. Um, are the way- Address for the record, sorry. I'm sorry? You need your address for the record. Um, Graft, 39 Grafton Street. Thank you. So um, is the, I, I know that originally the team had requested a waiver from the tree by law. Um, is, that, is that going through or what's happening with that? Ms. Keeper, is that still included on the list? I apologize, I'm not. It, it is still on the waiver list. Okay. Um, I would ask, how many trees are, you, are are being planned to be removed from the site? Um, so that would be the in that would be just, would that be for the development or the development plus the um, plus the compensatory storage plus the conservation areas? I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of the the scope. Yeah, well, it's a good question. Um, I guess for the whole, let's leave the conservation area off because I think we'll assume that the trees being removed there are simply not so, not for any utility particularly, but to um, like make the forest healthier. So um, if you can, you can split those out if you want to. But in terms of, so you can build the facility and do the flood storage area and all the other site work. How many trees are we talking about? Mr. Hessian, I don't think you have a, a fixed number, but what, it, what is the, the land area that would be, that is, would be impacted? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may just Mr. type in first, um, relative to the, the bylaw that's applicable, I believe the requirement that we asked a waiver for is that the developers to identify mature trees of uh, diameter of 10 inches or greater within the property's legal setback yards. Um, and then trees to be removed and setbacks to be replaced by a two and a half inch caliper. So it's, it's, it's kind of defined there what that, what that area is. It's not just generally as, as I read the bylaw provision. Okay. Yeah, it is. That is what the bylaw said at the time that you filed. When did you fi first file the uh, application? 2016. In 2016. Yeah, so that's what it said. Um, correct. Well, do you know how many trees you're talking about? Are we talking 10 trees? Are we talking 110 trees? Well, so I was going to ask Mr. Hessian sort of what the land area is. I think that'll give us sort of a. Oh, we don't. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't have that number, you know, off, off the top of my head, but in our waiver request, um, we state that the applicant agrees to submit tree plan to the board prior to issuance of a building permit 
to designate such trees and setback area of 10 inch diameter or more indicating weather replacement. So we're, we're, we're saying we're, we're gonna do it, but we don't have that information um, now. And, and I, I guess a question would that, as the development parcel and the conservation parcel has evolved, you know, the setback, I believe the setback area would be determined based on what we're proposing currently as the as the development parcel. So if there's any modific modifications to that, that might um, might also have a, a an impact on what that ultimate number is going to be. But do you, so, know the, do you know the acreage of the development parcel? I know the 12, 12 acres is the other side. So I just can't remember if we're subtracting from 17.7 .7 or what the. the it's five um, acres. 5.66 acres is the development parcel. Okay. Well, okay, so we don't know how many trees, um, but it, did you have a plan to, uh, to essentially comply with the bylaw? It sounds like you did. You, are you going to be replacing the inches lost? That's what the waiver, Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, that's what our waiver, waiver request currently states. Yes, okay, so you're going, you're going to, um, you're gonna submit a tree plan, but you're not going to compensate the town for removal of trees, which the bylaw requires. Is that, is that what it is? I believe the requirement is either replace the tree or, or pay a replacement fee. Okay. Under the old version of the bylaw, were you planning on doing that? I still don't have an answer. The waiver requests, so the, the this tree plan that we agreed to submit will indicate whether replacement by two and a half inch caliper tree on site or payment of the $500 to the tree fund. So that work, the number of trees, the counting, first of all, the, the boundary of the development parcel has not been finalized. So we can't identify what the setbacks are in that development parcel till that's finalized. And when we have that, we will be able to go out and stake that in the field, do that tree inventory, and then determine what trees are being planted as part of the current landscape plan. Do they need to be supplemented or you know, potentially the payment in lieu of an actual planting. Um, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I ask a couple of other questions? Ask them through me. Yes. Um, so my question is, number one, as far as trees that are planted, um, uh, is there a watering plan? Um, it, it, will they be responsible? Will you be responsible for them for a couple of years until they get, um, you know, they're safe in the ground if on was, was, there, was there any yeah i mean i guess my bottom line um mr chairman is that it's i think this is what miss chapnick said although i don't really understand conservation issues i think she was saying that yeah they're going to comply with these with the the local regulations um but she didn't want to waive she didn't want to waive them and like, and you could wonder, well, why would the town waive them since they're going to comply? And I would ask the same question of the tree bylaw. It sounds like the intention is to do what it said a few years ago, although un unfortunately the bylaws are much stronger now, but that's not going to apply. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I would also say that I, I would object to, to the waiver of the tree bylaw. Um, and would hope that they will take responsibility for making sure the trees get a good start in life um, for at least the first two years. And then the second item, and the, this is the only other thing I, I have, is um, I, I was looking at that um, this, this, the um, sketch of the, the, when you were talking about the fire truck going in and in the circle, and that was the main entrance. 
Um, is there any overhang there in the main entrance? It looks like, it seems to me that that main entrance is a place where people are going to want to sit and hang out, see people coming and going, kind of like their own little village square. It doesn't look like there's any shade there. I didn't see any greenery there. I saw a little greenery, but I didn't see any shade or awnings or roofs or, or pergolas or anything that would make that a comfortable place to be in hot weather. So it does face north. Mm -hmm. So it will be in shadow most of the time. Um, mm -hmm. But if I could ask Mr. Vlasic, I know that there's a canopy immediately at the entry doors. Is there any other shading features in the entry it, area? It looked very barren. That whole entrance looked very unwelcoming to me. And that was really all the comments I had. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I didn't know if you wanted me to add anything just, to that. Just briefly, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, you're correct, Mr. Chairman. It faces north. Um, there is, um, you know, an expanded sidewalk area. Um, you know, that could be uh, an area where potentially some some benches would be placed. But I think, and and you know, maybe Art and Gwen want to add something to this. I don't think we were necessarily conceiving of that area. You know, again, subject to maybe an operator coming in and giving us some more, you know, thoughts on that. We weren't really conceiving this area uh, as, um, you know, a place to gather or sit. I think that was contemplated as more of the south, uh, this area that I'm highlighting with my mouse right now. That was kind of the purpose of that porch area that Art was uh, mentioning earlier. So um, I think that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on my list, uh, Jennifer Griffiths. Hi, thank you. Hello. So my name's Jennifer Griffiths. I live at 4 Edith Street. Uh, so I'm in a butter to the move our property. Um, and I've also lived in this neighborhood for almost 30 years now. And so I'm sort of all about the water <laughs> and the flooding. So I have um, a few questions. And um, so one is about, um, you know, when we get a lot of rain, like we had just last week, um, the municipal stormwater system really can't handle more than it sort of already gets. Um, you know, the alewife brook level, uh, you know, it's all just fed by gravity and the alewife brook uh, comes up. And so there's not very much of a head change. And so um, I just want to know about the site putting any water into the municipal stormwater system, including when your garage floods and it needs to be pumped out. <laughs> so um, I want to just know, yes or no, is any water going to go into the municipal stormwater system? Mr. Hessian? <laughs> the question is whether the, there's any water from this project that would go into the municipal system. There's no water proposed, no stormwater runoff proposed from this site into the municipal system. The garage is being designed to not flood. The entrance will have, you know, that we've raised the elevation of the garage um, and the driveway access to it is being designed so that it will not, um, you know, the, the flood elevation will not enter the garage. Um, so there'll be no pumping from the, a flooded garage to the municipal system. Well, I, I don't believe that anything below the ground surface is, is never gonna flood. Um, I, I just, I don't believe that, but good luck to you with that. Um, so uh, the other piece is um, I think there's on site stormwater retention ponds. And I'm very concerned about those 
that's sort of localized uh, raising the groundwater level um, in that area. And there are homes that are, are not that far from where, um, where those ponds are. And I'm just really concerned that those will be impacted when stormwater is directed there. <clears throat> so I don't know if someone can comment on that. And I think that's the kind of thing that would be good to address in whatever written write up you're gonna you're gonna submit that the um, board, you know, has talked about. Mr. Hessian, do we have a? Um, there is subsurface infiltration facilities proposed as part of the design and submission of the with the stormwater management report. Um, groundwater mounting analyses were conducted. And the results of those show that there will be no impacts on any offsite properties. Um, I believe it was in Beta's, not their most recent peer review letter, but the one prior to that, where they um, raised that it might, it should, it's something that should be considered in the design of the senior living building and the duplexes, but nothing offsite. And I also believe when the geotechnical engineer from McPhail um, and Associates uh, presented a few hearings ago, he also um, presented information that the, the groundwater mounding from those uh, on-site infiltration systems will not cause problems to off-site properties. All right. Um... And then my, my well, I've got all kinds of concerns about this proposal because I think overall it's just too large. But um, one of my other big concerns is about um, sewage. This is the big, 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 this is a lot of people flushing a lot of stuff, using a lot of water. Um, and I have serious concerns about the capacity of the storm, I mean, of the storm, the sewage system and the piping. Um, again, not everything's tight. We've had issues before about sewage um, and the manholes um, during really, really bad flooding that we had in 1996 and in 2010. Um, you know, the sewage system is also not capable of handling everything. So I'm really concerned about adding just this huge amount of sewage to the system. And I'm wondering what you've done and how you can assure that the system is capable of handling all this. Um, Mr. Hashin, I don't know if that's a question you can address or if that's There's, it, we've, we've addressed that in prior response to comments to the to town comments. Mm -hmm. um, any, any specific deficiencies in the system where we're connecting in, in Dorothy Road, um, you know, is, is the project's responsibility to, to address if, if that pipe needs to be replaced. But, I know the town has been going through um, over the course of many years, the I and I um, study and mitigation program. Um, we have not to this point gotten any information on what's been completed or what the plans are for, you know, for the town to address, um, you know, this concern in, in this neighborhood. Um, yeah, I think I just, I'll just close with saying, you know, I'm downstream in both the stormwater system and the sewage system from this property. And, and folks, you know, further along, uh, so the gentleman that lives over on Fairmont Street, he's, he's even a little further down along the, the line. So it, it, this project doesn't just potentially impact direct neighbors, but folks further down those systems. So, um, Anyway, I just have serious concerns about the capacity of, of either one to, to handle a bigger, a big development like this. So I'll, I'll appreciate that. And I really want to express my appreciation to the zoning board. You guys are like 
superheroes. You do so much work and it's all volunteer. And as a resident and citizen of the town, I just really want to thank you. For thank you so much for that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, next on my list is uh, Marcy and Nick Eide. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Nicholas Eide. I live at 152 Lake Street. That's the corner of Lake and Little John. Uh, and I also would like to thank you for the opportunity to let the public speak. And I think it's it's great that you guys give so much of your time and so late in the day. And I appreciate that very much. Um, I have two questions and comments. One is the you know the 412 trips per day. Um, I also uh, like Mr. Krupp have a hard time understanding how that's insignificant. I mean, if you think about a, a 12 hour day, that's 34 trips per hour. So that's like one trip every two minutes. That's if everything's averaged down in a constant flow over 12 hours, which is probably not what's going to happen. And things are going to glut up and they already do glut up. And so I'm a little bit concerned about that. I know we've talked about traffic ad nauseum, but you know, I really, really have a hard time understanding how that's insignificant um, because the, the only place people can go is to Lake Street. There is no other way out of that area except to get on Lake Street. So that is an influx of things onto Lake Street and they have to get to Lake Street from streets like Little John or you know maybe Homestead or what have you up further. But there's very few ways to get over to Lake Street. And so you know, you're in a, a sleepy neighborhood that's now gonna have all this extra traffic. So um, I just wanted to kind of raise that up a little bit. And then the, uh, so it's really more of a, a comment, I guess. And the other thing I have is a question uh, I did notice the the truck traffic uh, illustrations were provided. I appreciate that very much. And I think there were a couple sets of those provided. Uh, and they show the the very large truck with the trailer that's the low boy trailer with the uh, goodness, seven sets of wheels in the back or whatever it is. It's quite a sizable thing. And on the pictures, you can see that, oh my goodness, in order for it to round the corner one way, it has to brush the curb on the one side. It's brushing the curb of everything. This barely can fit in there. And on the return trip, it's brushing the other sides of everything and can barely fit in there. Having lived here for 13 years, I can tell you for certain that the snow removal does not allow for that. I can guarantee you that there will be large mounds of snow, three to four feet high, that stick out five to six feet into the street on both sides at the corner of Lake and Little John. And I'm extremely concerned about this because my house is downstream of that. What happens is if somebody does come through and plow that out, it then goes and blocks my driveway apron. Because what happens is Little John is the first thing where snow can dump into from a long stretch. And then if you're around the corner, that's where I'm gonna be. And my question is, who on earth is going to remove all of this snow so that these people can run these trucks. The I forget how many times a day they said they were gonna run during the construction, but this whole thing to me is just, it's so oversized and pushing the envelope of anything that's possible or practical or feasible. And I really, I know we, a lot of us have said this before, it just seems like it's too much for this neighborhood. So I guess the only actual direct question there is how on earth is that snow going to be removed? Who is going to remove the snow? Um. Ms. Kiefer, I don't know if you want to address that or if I should ask Mr. Clifford to address that question. So uh, just so I understand the question. So the question is for construction vehicles during the winter? Yes. Yeah, that's my understanding is that the, because the construction vehicles need the full width of the roadway and the town doesn't plow curb to curb, does would the would would snow removal to allow the trucks to make their full turns, would that be something that would be included in the construction, um, the construction plan? Uh, so I, I think, and, and Art, I'll have you chime in, but I, I believe um, the response is kind of multifaceted, actually. Um, so um, I don't know that construction in the winter is the ideal time that we would be, we'd be doing it. Um, but secondly, even if there is some overlap in, the, in, in a winter period, um, construction is, is going to be detailed within the construction management plan. Um, and, and that's that's in coordination with public works and, and um, police and fire in terms of, um, I think we had shown a, a, one of our plans had like where we put those flaggers being. Um, and then the, the third part of it also is that 
uh, that that truck was assuming modular construction. So there may be flexibility on that as well. So um, as, as we proposed in our response to comments, um, we, we will be submitting a construction management plan and we propose that the best time to do that is at the stage where we're, um, you know, when we have the contractor on board and, and these details are, you know, it's, it's a, a realistic document. Um, and I know that sometimes um, one of the things that is, is useful if a, a developer has like a website for the development, if they have kind of like, sometimes you call it like a look ahead that gives the neighborhood um, updates. And, and I think that we would be amenable to doing that. Um, it keeps not only the, the town officials informed, but it also keeps people in the neighborhood informed. So I don't know, Art, if you wanna add anything to that response? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I, I think the major thing is that uh, the, the trucks that he's referring to would be the modulars, assuming we built the project with using modules and that would not be done during a snow season. So I think that's not an issue. And there's traffic management too. Um, Mr. I, did you have anything further? Uh, yeah, I guess just based on that, it, I, I'm a little surprised because every other meeting I've been to, it's been highly reliant on this modular construction. And that in fact has dictated the awful large size of everything. And uh, so that's interesting. Um, I guess if, uh, if they're only going to do construction during the sunny months out of the year, then uh, you know, that's their business. So I think, I guess the answer is they will not deal with the snow because they're simply not going to work uh, during three months out of the year. So, so let's, you know, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just add to that. The, the actual delivery of the modules, uh, assuming it's built that way, would be in a matter of weeks, uh, not mm -hmm. months. And so it's, it's fairly easy to control that and avoid any kind of uh, uh, entanglement with snow. It, it's, not, it's not something that goes on for three months. Very, very quick. And that's, you know, one of the advantages of modules is that uh, the whole project goes faster. So the interruption of the neighborhood is, is uh, less severe. Um, Chairman? Thank you. Um, Mr. Hanlon? Uh, I just wanted to, because of where the discussion is, to remind everyone that one of Beta's points with respect to the, and one of the things that Mr. McGrath addressed with respect to the construction plan is providing something that it can be developed over time, as for example, the stormwater plan really is too. There's, it has lots of provisions for being fine-tuned and, and changed over time. But where some of the major issues that we already kind of know the answers to can be sketched out in the beginning and details filled in as appropriate when things get closer uh, so that we don't have to choose either we're trying to be over detailed now or delaying addressing the questions until way after this hearing is over. So Mr. McGrath had some suggestions about that and I'm hoping that uh, in the next several weeks, uh, we can have a discussion of that to see if there's some way of, of bridging that difference and providing more assurances than uh, uh, more, probably some additional insurance. Cause obviously this whole range of considerations is something that matters for the neighborhood. Okay. And at the same time, there's much that can't be done until you've got a construction manager and you're ready to go. Um, and it should be that there's a compromise in terms of the timing there. All right, thank you. Um, so we are at 1012 and I have four names on the list and I will absolutely get to those four names, but um, if we could, if, um, if, the, if the public is amenable to keeping it to those four, that would be, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, next up is Sarah Ogden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name's Sarah Allgood. I live at 73 Dorothy Road. So I am directly across the road from the development. Um, I have three comments uh, and a question. First of all, I would like to iterate the neighborhood um, comment with regard to giving thanks to yourself, Chairman Klein and other board members for the time that you've taken to do a, a deep delve into this development and, and move the project forward in a, in a meaningful way. I would also like to thank Mr Hanlon for his earlier comment tonight about requesting 
um, a more comprehensive overview of the flood mitigation um, strategies proposed by the applicant for our neighbourhood. Um, I specifically want to touch on that point as if you had travelled in our neighbourhood over the last seven to ten days, you will see that despite the fact that it's the end of August, the middle of the summer, we have had excessive flooding. Numerous basements have had floodwaters several feet deep. You only had to walk the neighbourhood to see multiple people's sump pumps pumping out into the road, pumping out into their garden, the water then draining back into their basements. So I really want to sort of build on the comments that Miss um, Stamps and a few others have made today. So my primary concern is flooding. Um, I have a drain at the bottom of my driveway. Um, I'm a relatively new development. I was built in 2003. I flooded once, um, but even a couple of weeks ago with the recent rainfall, we had the surface water level inches, inches below <laughs> my driveway and my basement. Others who are at a slightly lower elevation on Mary Street, they were completely flooded. And pumping that out is just not a possibility because you're trying to pump out the, the you know, the water table, which is almost impossible to do. So that's a long uh, preamble, but really the question that I would like to ask to, to Mr. Hessian um, is I understand that it's very difficult to try and have exact numbers in, in place, but given the fact that the tree ordinance says that if you remove a 10 inch tree, you only need to replace it with a two and a half inch diameter tree, or pay $500 per tree to the tree fund. So when you are doing your compensatory storage, do you take into consideration the excess water that is not being consumed by a two and a half inch diameter tree compared to the 10 inch tree that you have removed? I'm certainly not a tree warden, but it is my understanding that a one inch diameter tree consumes somewhere in the region of 10 gallons of water per week per tree. So if you're removing a 10 inch tree, which is approximately 45 years old, you are taking out a tree that's consuming about 100 gallons of water per week. And you are only going to replace that either with $500, which doesn't consume any water, or a two and a half inch diameter tree, which consumes 25 gallons of water, is that differential taken into consideration when you are developing the compensatory water storage to prevent our neighborhood from flooding further? Mr. Hessian, is that a question you can address? You're on mute though. I can try. Um, it's it's not a question that can be addressed specifically, but um, there, there's a, a number of different things in that the the floodplain storage and then the compensatory flood storage um, doesn't really relate to the existing tree, you know, canopy tree caliper that that's on site. But the, the Conservation Commission's requirement for a two to one compensatory storage volume does, I guess in, in, in essence, indirectly provide a little factor of safety there that, so with, with the fill of that floodplain, um, we're, we're, we're providing twice the volume to address what's been missed. And, and the other way indirectly that I guess it's um, considered is in the stormwater management design and the recharge requirements to groundwater. Um, we're recharging stormwater from all the impervious 
areas on the site. So it's not the same as, you know, the, the trees in, in, in lack of a better term, drinking that rainfall, but it's, it's a way of mimicking what is going back into the water table, the groundwater um, through collecting that stormwater from those impervious surfaces and recharging it into the groundwater. Thank you for that. Ms. Ogden, sure. anything further? If I may respond, Chairman Klein? Please. Thank you. So, um, you know, this may be a very uh, simplistic question. So even if you don't build anything, even if you just remove a one 10 inch diameter tree, potentially that drinks 100 gallons of, of water a week from an area, this is one tree from an area, and you just replace it from a floodplain, which does flood, you only have to stop by our neighborhood now and you will see it in flood and you replace that with a two and a half inch tree, which would potentially consume 25 gallons of water or $500 to the tree fund, which consumes zero gallons of water. Is the differential per tree taken into consideration when you're doing your compensatory storage? Because this volume of water needs to be taken into consideration because this volume of water is going to end up in our neighborhood even without you building anything just the removal of the tree and i understand that it's it's challenging and you you haven't done a full survey of the site to to get a handle on how many trees are there how big they are i mean you've got to remember many 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 of the trees over there are much larger than 10 inches much larger so they consume much greater volumes of water and it's a concern at the moment the flooding here is bad as at the moment so removing trees and replacing them with two and a half inch trees is just not going to figure into how it's not going to create an even worse situation for flooding in our neighborhood well, thank you for that. I was going through your neighborhood today and just seeing all the, the piles of sandbags at the end of people's driveways is a little disconcerting. Um, Very much needed as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you, Chairman Klein. Oh, thank you. Um, next on my list um, is uh, Lisa Fredman. Hi. Thank you. I'm Lisa Fredman. I live at 63 Mott Street. And like the previous speakers, I really, really appreciate your concern about the abutters and the neighbors' comments and questions. So I'd like to add to uh, Mr. Krupp's comments about the traffic impact. And Chairman Klein, I don't know when you came to our neighborhood today but I'm sure that if you tried to turn right or even turn left on any street from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., the only street you could have entered our neighborhood on was Birch Street. So all of these comments about how the 400 extra cars per day will only impact Little John Street is kind of astounding to me. I mean, what I see are lots of cars going down Mott Street, which is one way, and it's an adorable street. And lots of people and lots of families and lots of kids walk down this street. I also see lots of cars turning right from the development onto Dorothy and then onto Thorndike Street. Thorndike Street is the access to the dog park and to the soccer fields. And if anyone comes into our neighborhood at any time, any afternoon, you won't find any parking available in the parking lot by Thorndike Field because all of the people who are going to the dog park and to the soccer games that their kids are playing are there. And so the idea that this community, which is such a lovely, walkable, family-oriented community, can handle 400 more cars and they'll, a day and they'll only go down Little John is 
um, kind of astounding to me. And the impact on the entire community will be felt. And I also just want to say, I mean, I think a lot of us understand development is inevitable. And most of us feel that the townhouses would be fine. It's just the senior living complex that's raising so many environmental, traffic, and people-oriented questions. And as someone who just turned 65, I'm really concerned about the attitude about older adults. You know, I mean, older adults who need senior housing need so many services, as Mr. Krupp and I have talked about at previous meetings. And those of us who are seniors are actually quite independent and probably don't need the type of services that you're proposing because it's sort of an easy out to get to get a development there. So my main concern is how the entire neighborhood is going to be impacted by these 400 extra cars, especially during the periods when you can only turn into our neighborhood through Birch Street. That's a real concern and it seems to have been totally overlooked by the development team. And then how so many of the other aspects of our neighborhood really, I think will be jeopardized by adding the senior housing. So those are my comments. Thank you for that. Um, I did just have a quick follow-up question for Mr. Roach. What, what is the current, um, do we have current figures for the number of cars that are in this neighborhood on a given day? Uh, from what the site's gonna produce or what's there existing? For existing. Um, yeah, they for, the, been in there. for the no build condition. For the no build condition. Yeah, I don't think they've changed since the original analysis. So I got to pull them up. Can Which I specific... ask you, Mr. Roach, when was the initial analysis done? Um, November 2020, but that's just the, he's asking specifically about the. Um, development of the no build conditions um, the, the no build conditions is what it would be like uh, i think like five ten years after the opening assuming right. that nothing is built right assuming the project isn't built correct um so what specific volume of which which road were you looking at well basically we're talking about adding 412 trips to the neighborhood so i'm curious what the number of trips is currently Oh, I was to say, I say peak hour trips on the, the side streets. I think we do an ATR to get daily volumes on Lake Street here. Hold on. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you have numbers specific for the neighborhood that is sort of neighborhood generated trips. Well, again, I can tell you what's coming in and out of the side streets on the peak hours. Mm -hmm. But I do not have daily, we, we, we don't have daily volumes for all of the different side streets. I think we did. It doesn't even look like we do have that either. Okay. Um, so I don't think we have daily volumes on those, but I, I have peak hour volumes from the, from the counts that we conducted I see. Okay. and then adjusted for COVID and then grown to 2027. If you want Little John, Birch Street, Margaret, I... I have AM, PM. Mm -hmm. We don't have, we don't, I, I'm just trying to get a, a sense because I, a, a number of people have sort of raised the, the question that 412 sounds like a really big number. Um, and so I'm trying to equate that to what the number, the number is otherwise to get a, a better sense as to what that. <laughs> yeah, what I, that like, like I'm saying, I, I, we, we did peak hour counts. Yeah. Right, so we, we, we only have four hours of counts at the intersections, so we don't have a daily number for you what's coming in. Now, we, what we could do is we could uh, get an estimate of the number of houses mm -hmm. that are in the area and, and do an IT trip generation for single family houses and, and, and tell you what that is. But I, I also don't have that in front of me. Oh, we lost your audio. Oh. Well, I think you could also add the number of kids to play soccer at Thorndike Field during off hours and calculate at least one car per kid. 
yeah, and then so add the number of people who go to the dog park and i would calculate three quarters of them have cars and they're going through the neighborhood and then i would also add the number of people who don't park at the alewife tea station who park in our neighborhood and i've noticed over the past couple of months that more and more people are parking in our neighborhood instead of going to the alewife tea station yeah so we're really overcrowded right now as it is yeah mr chairman uh could i make a comment um on briefly but i've got other people i need to get to all right uh, i just wanted to add a little bit about uh, number one uh, we did think that that 412 number is based on a younger population uh which might be driving and I, I just think it's really important to keep in mind because we felt that we were making a, some real progress by making the senior housing because it's self-regulating. You know, people, residents that have a choice will not come and go at peak hours. The staff has a choice. They won't come at peak hours. Even doctors and, and people who come in business, they won't come at peak hours because of Lake Street. So you can't, it's very hard to take a bunch of numbers that are not on a street like Lake Street and, and extrapolate it. And I'm only saying that because we felt like we were really making progress. As you know, we weren't uh, asked to do senior housing. We, we went there. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I don't think, I don't think anybody's, you know, we went to reduce otherwise, I think we're, we're just trying to get a better feel for what the overall, you know, what the, you know, is it, I think we're just trying to, you know, just get a sensory sense as to, you know, what it really is. Okay. Um, but that has nothing to do with, you know, the, the efforts the applicant has made to uh, come up with alternate proposals that have, you know, vastly reduced the amount of traffic impact. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Uh, this is Pat. I, I just wanted to, I think that there's a certain degree of talking past one another going on here. The analysis that's been done so far is focused on the peak hour, where you're talking about some numbers in the neighborhood of, about, of around 25 trips an hour. Um, and what Ms. Griffith is, is raising, or maybe it wasn't Ms. Griffith, I, I'm Ms. Ogut is raising, is something different from that. She's suggesting that the daily counts matter uh, as much for a different reason, and that is that uh, the neighborhood itself has got more traffic in it already than it knows what to do with. And adding all of these trips, regardless of the congestion issue, but just having more activity itself diminishes the quality of life in the neighborhood. So I think, you know, we need to sort of deal with it. We need to focus on the fact that there are two different considerations here. One is what are you adding to congestion? Uh, and that's what the report that we have really focuses on. And the other is the possibility that just increasing the average amount of trips throughout the day uh, will increase the activity in the neighborhood in a way, way that the neighborhood would object to. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. Edmund, did you have anything further? Sorry, I unmuted. No, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate and that. Thanks for the summary, Mr. Hanlon. Um, next on my list is Robin uh, Doty. Uh, thank you, Chairman Klein. This is actually Shona Gibson of 107 Mary Street. I'm on Robin Doughty's computer. Um, I'm the person who's the nurse practitioner who uh, spends um, several days a week working over at the, uh, the assisted living facility at Alewife Brook Parkway. Um, I have uh, just a question and then I just want to share um, uh, just a, a brief anecdote of something that I think is germane. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the traffic flow around the proposed a senior living facility, or I, I suppose around the whole development, uh, entering from uh, Little John and um, exiting onto Dorothy. Is, is that a one-way traffic flow or, or two-way? Um, 
could ask Mr. Hessian to confirm, but I believe there's there's a single entrance to the main portion of the building, which would be a two-way um, roadway at the corner of Little John and Dorothy Road. And then the, the townhouses would have their own separate entrances. Okay, and so, so um, it will be two-way uh, going from Little John into the, um, the senior living and then able to exit back out onto Little John. Yes. Yes, okay. And so um, in the case of an emergency vehicle, and I know we've spoken at other meetings about the fact that there will be a, a somewhat steady flow of emergency vehicles um, if we build a senior living facility. Um, the It was concerning to me to hear that um, just due to the size of something like a fire truck, uh, they would be able to drive around the building but I, I heard um, a description of them having to uh, perhaps mount a curb um, just due to the width of the truck and um, also having to back up in front of the building because they, um, they would get to the, to the front entrance but not be able to continue um, just due, due to the design. And I, I actually think that this whole thing just, just actually points to the fact that it's too much building in this type of space. But the, the, the brief anecdote I just wanted to tell, which is um, sadly, it's a true story that happened to one of my patients up at um, Alewife, is I think, um, uh, you know, we are talking about folks in their uh, maybe mid to upper 70s, all the way into their 90s. And, um, you know, at, at those ages, you know, certain things are just true, whether or not you're in, in relatively uh, good health for your age or not, you are older. And um, uh, uh, one of my uh, patients was was very sadly uh, knocked over by a garbage truck um, uh, and, you know, badly injured and hospitalized, etc. And I, I just want to make the point that that we worry over at that building all the time about um, the folks who are the residents of the building being out and about in front of the building, uh, you know, um, socializing, uh, just hanging out, etc. But we worry about folks a lot in terms of the traffic that comes up there. And uh, this was just a particularly awful thing that actually ended up happening to this lady. But it's it's something that people talk about on a daily basis is so and so safe is so and so safe to be out there by themselves. Um, I, I know this might sound a little patronizing to people who are not in this line of work. It's not intended to be patronizing in any way. It's just a reality of um, as as all of us get older, um, our some of our sensory ability diminishes some of our ability to to move the way we used to when we were young diminishes. And uh, sometimes our cognition diminishes. So I worry a lot about that. I worry a lot about somebody perhaps uh, walking on the sidewalk at the back and then not realizing that a fire truck is uh, perhaps coming around the corner of the back of the building in a hurry, um, maybe having to mount the curb there and somebody not having the wherewithal to get out of the way. Um, so I just think it's important for folks to realize that stuff like that really happens. Um, and just to, to, to just to finally just say, I, I really wholeheartedly I agree with all of my neighbors who who say uh, we understand that development happen happens. Uh, we could live with six townhouses on Dorothy Road. We would be happy to have new neighbors, but uh, this doesn't fit into our neighborhood. It dwarfs us and is going to um, have all sorts of completely unintended consequences, um, which we are uh, quite concerned about. So thank you and the rest of the ZBA for your time and um, for your attention to this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate, appreciate your, your, uh, your sad anecdote. I do hope that person is, is on the mend. Um, the uh, last name I have on my list is uh, Martha Ingalls. Yes, hi, this is Martha Ingalls at 148 Herbert Road. And Appreciate your patience. I have two comments, a comment and an idea. The comment is that 
the idea that you're going to have this population of people come and live in this area and once they've moved in they're going to discover that it doesn't make sense to try and go anywhere at rush hour and god forbid they have a heart attack at 5 30 in the evening or eight o'clock in the morning an ambulance would have trouble getting to them that seems like a bait and switch situation and i don't think it's kind or fair or moral to suggest people move into this situation. Mm -hmm. The suggestion that I have is tangentially related. It's also about traffic. Um, one thing that causes the huge number of projected vehicle trips in and out of the neighborhood is the fact that there's no retail at all within three quarters of a mile of the site. Every time a resident wants to buy a cup of coffee, a bottle of aspirin, or some toilet paper, they will either drive somewhere or place an order for it to be delivered by vehicle. If it were possible to include a small convenience store within the common space of the development, that would cut down on traffic and could benefit the neighbors in the pre-existing neighborhood too. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Sure. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment period for this evening. Um, such an interesting, sorry, it's just an interesting, an interesting recommendation. I had not considered that. Um, So going forward for us, uh, we had discussed previously um, that uh, continuing this evening, our continuation date would be September 28th. Just want to confirm that that date was still good for um, both the applicant and for, uh, for Paul Haverty as well. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chairman, I thought that the hearing was to close by the by the uh, 17th. Um, in my notes, um, I had, sorry. I think it's October 1st. Is it October 1st? I believe so. That's it's the Friday to... after the 28th. Okay. Was I was I looking at the prior version then? I think yes, so. there once was a time when it I was. I think so. Okay. I know oh, yeah, I had okay. Yeah, that makes sense because I think at the last hearing I had I had proposed that we close the public hearing on October 8th, but you were but the applicant had asked that we change that to the first. Okay. And I believe that's what we had approved. Um, which I need to change that on the on the website because I believe I had the eighth put up on the website. Um, so the board we currently have a hearing scheduled for the fourteenth. Um, so we have three we have three regular hearings on the fourteenth, um, and the, so we were planning to continue to the twenty eighth. Um, Is there a recommendation to possibly move that up to the, I think to, to the, I know the, to the 21st or had we intentionally moved to the 28th because we were, there's a holiday that week that we may have been trying to avoid. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, and I, I actually defer to Mr. Haverty, but my, recollection was that the intention with the hearing on the 28th was to potentially make that the last hearing and the subject matter would be a review of a draft of conditions that uh, would be produced between between now and then based on everything that we've that we've got. Um, so obviously if that's true moving it up is not a very good idea because, it puts more, either more pressure on Mr. Haverty to write the conditions or more pressure on us to figure out what they mean. Um, and 
so I, I do think it might be worth asking Mr. Haverty whether he still can is can can accommodate that that schedule. But obviously, the last hearing date that we have needs to be a time when the public and when the applicant and when we can begin, you know, focusing in on the condition so that we understand what everybody thinks about it at, before we go into the de deliberation phase. So if we don't get to that point on the 28th, we I think we need to be looking at some date beyond the 28th because that last step has got to happen. Absolutely. And I my, my notes concur with what, what you've just said, that we were looking to um, to begin the draft discussion on the 28th uh, um, so we could have public comment on it. Um, Mr. Haverty, would, does that work with your schedule? Going to be tight getting a decision to you by the 28th. Um, I was hoping to have received suggested revisions by the applicant in advance of that. Okay. Um, in particular, there's been you know, quite a number of changes to the plan set that it would be helpful to sort of get that in a narrative form. Definitely the 21st is, so I think we can shoot for the 28th, be discussing a draft decision and I'll do my best to get it to you by then. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Please. If, if we got a draft decision on the 28th and everybody else did too, mm -hmm. there won't be enough time to actually make the hearing on, hearing on the 28th, very useful. Um, now, a lot of the purpose of this last business is actually to benefit the applicant and make sure that the applicant has the opportunity to let us know what they think mm -hmm. uh, about all of this. And I wonder if given the time constraints that even the 28th suggests, I wonder if Ms. Kiefer has any new thinking about what would be appropriate in terms of us giving her an, opp an opportunity and ourselves an opportunity to think about these conditions before we go into deliberation when, as you know, we have to be <clears throat> blind, deaf, and dumb, and we can't say we're not dumb, actually, um, uh, and can't get any new information. I'm, I'm concerned that everybody has an opportunity to sign off on something they've had an opportunity to address. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Please. Uh, to, if I may respond to Mr. Hanlon, yeah. um, I, and, and again, maybe I'm looking at old information, but I, I, I anticipated that at one point we had talked about um, the draft, and, and Paul, I'm not trying to do anything here to put either one of us in a bind, but I had at being 923 that a draft has to be circulated. Is that, is that, was I looking at an, an, a, a, a still an old one when I had that down in my notes? That may have been the target date we were shooting for. Um, but, but again, I haven't, you know, the, the new information just came in in the last couple of days. Right, no, I hear you. Yeah, and I haven't seen, you know, your proposed revisions to the earlier decision. So right now I would be starting at, you know, point zero in drafting a decision. Sure, that that's going to be a sufficient time frame. Mm -hmm. So, if I could ask for a clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. the, the the next hearing would just be to review proposed conditions. Is that so? The, the original intention, I think, had been that you know, assuming the close of this hearing, um, the seat, well, the the session of the hearing this evening, assuming that we feel that we've gotten you know, a good sense as to what the project entails, which I think we have, um, which is the sort of the intention of the last, you know, four or six weeks of work would be that we would try to put together a draft decision that we could discuss at the 28th. Um, but obviously we need to work with, with everyone's schedules and to make sure that we have, um, you know, sufficient time to put it together in a, in a timely fashion so that we all have an opportunity to look at it before the meeting. Um, and so I think what, you know, what Mr. Haverty is saying is that 
you know, absent of you know, a lot of comment um, in relation to all the new changes that have come about since we last started in on a decision that you know, having it prepared between now and the 23rd um, you know, without significant input from the outside is gonna be difficult. Um, and that, you know, if we get, if, we, if we're able to get a draft just in time for the 28th, it's really not, you know, as Mr. Handler says, it's not gonna be really helpful to any of us to discuss it on the 28th if we're only just seeing it for the first time. Um, so from the, for the board, just, just so everyone else is aware, um, so Tuesday, October 12th, we already have a meeting. We have five hearings scheduled for that evening. Um, and Tuesday, October 26th, we already have a hearing scheduled and I believe it's either two or three for that evening. I can't recall. So if the 28th, if the 28th is just too tight, um, I think we could discuss the possibility of going to the fifth, which would give us an additional week um, to put things together. Obviously, if we were to do that, we would need to push out the, we would need to extend the overall, um, you know, the 180 day hearing, uh, we'd need to push that out as well. But the 28th is a Tuesday. I don't know, you know, I don't know if pushing it to Thursday, the 30th is helpful. Um, uh, Art and Gwen, I, I think I would have to ask your input. Um, if if you're saying there's a hearing on the fifth, if we push the deadline to the eighth, Art and Gwen. So we have so the the fifth is available. Right. And, and so then I, I'm, I'm, I would ask Art and Gwen if you want to weigh in if um, the applicant, if you think that we could agree to extending it out to the sixth or the seventh or the eighth for the deadline, if we, if there were a hearing on the fifth to review the draft decision. I, that's your judgment call, really, Stephanie. Uh, you know, we we know that the the owner is wanting to move move this along <laughs> but um it has to be in a schedule that you can work with that you and mr hanlon and, i mean and mr haverty and so on can and work with so you you make it you make a decision i, I think it's yeah, for us it's okay it's, it's okay with you We're okay with you that, that's fine we we could extend it mr chairman until the um, the seventh or eighth, and have that hearing then on the fifth to review. Mr. Haverty, does that extra week help? Yes, it helps tremendously. Um, and, and if I could get the suggested revisions, you know, probably at least a week before then to give me time to. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. okay. That would be very helpful. So, I, so then we would be proposing to extend the public hearing until Friday, October 8th, and then voting to continue to October 5th. Um, so if we're going to try to do this final hearing um, going through the, um, the draft decision, would it be possible to start the meeting um, instead of at 7.30 to start the meeting earlier, just to give ourselves some extra, some extra time. The people make 6.30 on the October 5th. Uh, it's okay with us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then with that in mind, um, day being the ninth, um, we plan on um, 
is on Monday or Tuesday. Do we have, do we have some time Monday, Tuesday at 10 where we could just um, have a quick coordination call to make sure that we're on track for getting the documentation together? Mr. Chairman, which Monday or Tuesday would that be? Oh, I'm sorry, September 13 and 14. I just think tomorrow is just a little too quick. So, so Monday the 13th, I'm actually free pretty much all day. Tuesday, I'm a little more tied up. Can you Monday, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Okay. Ms. Kiefer, would you be available Monday at 10? I would have said. Okay. Okay, I will see about getting an invite out for that. Okay. So then, um, so Mr. Haverty will revise the draft decision to align with the updated proposal and request waivers, the revised draft will be released publicly on or before, and we said um, September 28. Does that work? All does that work for you? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the hearing to discuss it will be held Tuesday, October 5th at 6.30 p.m. And the vote will be taken at the end of that hearing. But if we go, and then so we need to now expire the hearing on October 8th. If I'm here, All right. So um, I can have a motion to extend the public hearing period for Thorndike Place until Friday, October. 8th, 2021. So moved. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Rourke. Um, so a vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Oh, I see you mouthing aye. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Revelack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Chair votes aye. So we are extending the hearing until October 8th. And then if I could have a motion to continue uh, the hearing on Thorndike Place until Tuesday, October 5th at 6.30 PM. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Rourke. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Revelack? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued um, on Thorndike Place until October 5th. And I will get back to, um, to uh, Mr. Haverty and Ms. Kiefer um, and others about setting up a a call from Monday at 10 a.m. to just coordinate and make sure that we're getting everything together so we can stay on track. Um, so just briefly, oops, I meant to have this up already before we adjourn. This won't be helpful now because all my dates are wrong. Um, but the, just wanted to bring up the calendar for the board. Now I'm going to have to adjust. Okay, so today was Thursday, September 9th. That's done. So Tuesday, September 14th at 7.30, we have hearings for 2020A Lafayette Street, 14 Nicod Street, and 53 Marathon. We are now continuing for our vote. At um, continuation till six 
oops, until the 5th at 6.30 p.m. And then Friday the 8th is the vote of the public hearing. Tuesday the 12th, we have hearings for 1416 Edgerton Road, 18 Heard Road, 125-127 Webster Street, 43 Fox Middle Lane, and 24 Ottawa Road. And then on Tuesday the 26th, we currently have hearings for 5 Cheviot Road and 43 Cutter Hill Road. So that is our current schedule moving forward. Stop sharing that. Okay, well, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially want to thank uh, Rick Valavelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Linema for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. To conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I have a second. 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 Work. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Work. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. For Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night everyone. Good night. Good night.